A Recap of Gardens of the Moon by Stephen Erickson, Malazan Book of the Fallen, Book 1. Prologue. Twelve-year-old Genoa's Perron stands on the wall of Mox Hold, looking out over the mouse quarter of Malaz City. His father is within, discussing trade with the fist who runs Mox Hold. Genoa's is approached by an unnamed commander of the Bridge Burners. They discuss the death of Dasimulter, the Empire's first sword, at the city of Igaton. The commander is approached by another bridge burner with a fiddle on his back and the two start discussing the purge of the mouse quarter and then Surly's change of name to Lazine. Genoz interjects that the name Lazine means throw master in the Napin tongue. Surly herself then appears, flanked by claw acolytes. The commander relays orders to his companion to contain the problem in mouse. The soldier nods and leaves. Surly and the commander exchange veiled threats and the commander asserts that her laws against sorcery will not survive Kellen's return. Surly dismisses the commander and leaves. Genoz tells the commander that he will be a soldier when he grows up. The commander warns him against it but is met with nothing but derision from the boy. Chapter 1 Itko, Kansas Seven years have passed since the events in the prologue. A young fisher girl stands on the roadside and Itko connects to an old woman named Riga as the army rides by on the road. The old woman has a bag of candles while the fisher girl is bringing twine to her father because their net was taken in the deep water. Suddenly, the old woman knocks the basket of twine from the fisher girl's head and grips her hair painfully. Riga begins spouting prophecy at the fisher girl, claiming that the girl will be the last to hear her, and Riga will be the last one to speak to the girl. Riga claims the girl's soul will be embraced by shadow but that Riga will preserve her because they are linked. Riga also tells the fisher girl that the lord spawned in darkness shall be the hand to free her. One of the riders stops and cracks the old woman's skull, killing her. He rides off and the army passes by but the girl remains there, with Riga's corpse sprawled across her lap. A man swathed in black approaches and tries to calm her while a shorter man stands in the road looking after the army that has just passed and mocks the other two quietly. The shorter man raises his arms and a darkness descends. As it dissipates, seven hounds lie on the road with him, likewise staring after the army. The short man sends them tearing after the horses. The two figures then reveal themselves to be Cotillion and Aminus, and they seem to be discussing what to do with the fisher girl. Cotillion says that she will do for their purposes, and it is implied that they will use the fisher girl as an instrument of vengeance against the Empress Lazine. The fisher girl mutters something indicating that she and the old woman are now one person, having joined at the moment of the old woman's death. With that, shadows flow out from Cotillion to embrace the fisher girl and she knows no more. An unnamed captain is accompanying the adjunct as they are riding towards the area of the massacre. The captain is wary of the adjunct to the empress who grills him about his past and his thoughts on the purge there. The area of Itko Khan where the Hounds of Shadow killed the entire 19th Regiment of the Itko Khanese 8th Cavalry, 175 men and women as well as 210 horses has been put under guard. The soldiers, despite being veterans of the Siege of Lihing and the Wiccan Wars, are disturbed by the sight of the bloody carnage. From a promontory, the captain and the adjunct look out over thousands of gulls and crows eating the dead men and horses. All had weapons out and fought what attacked them, but the only dead are Malazan. There are no signs of an invading force, and whoever attacked also killed the local inhabitants. Over four hundred dead. The adjunct notices someone riding through the bodies and the captain tells her it is Genoz Peran, a lieutenant new to his command from Unta. Lorne requests his presence and the captain signals him over. Genoz tells of two empty huts, one belonging to Riga, the other to the fisher girl and her father. The fisher girl's father seems to have taken his boat out and left the area. Lorne asks what killed the soldiers and Genoz offers his opinion that it was done with teeth, by animals as big as meals. Lorne has Peran take her to the hut, instructing the captain to clean up the massacre as quickly as possible. After speaking with Genoz for a short while, the adjunct decides to take him on as a commissioned officer on her staff. The adjunct is open and honest with Genoz, telling him that something has happened and killing all of these people was simply a diversion to keep them from knowing what really happened. The purpose of the adjunct is to hunt down mages and kill them, as well as act as the will of the empress. 
Jinoz is sent to Garam to investigate the Fisher family while Loan requests the records of any new recruits for the Malaysian army as well as the captain's opinions on the nobility in the military command structure. The Fisher girl takes the name Sari and enlists in the Malaysian marines. She requests a spot in High Fist Dijak Onurm's host. The recruiter, Staff Sergeant Aragon, notices the mud on her boots is the wrong color for the region and that it hasn't rained there in days. Jinoz goes to Garam and finds it empty. Everyone has fled apart from the soldiers at the local constabulary who have all been killed. The constabulary with the bodies is full of black pigeons, obviously brought there by sorcery. Anta. Paran rides off, contemplating his lot as a noble and the massacre of the 8th Cavalry. He remembers the words of the commander back on Mox Hold, telling him to live quietly and he realizes now the aid to the adjunct that he has not done so. Riding along numbly, he sees a figure on the road, dressed all in green leather and wool and bearing only a long knife in the style of a seven cities warrior. The figure is Topper, the Empress's chief claw assassin, and the murderer of all of Unta's royal line. Jinoz, as an Untan noble, is immediately offended by him. They wait until a warren opens for them. Topper has been sent to lead Jinoz to the adjunct. Their trip through the Imperial Warren is uneventful, though filled with verbal sniping at each other. Finally they arrive at a basalt arch, carved with a clawed talon holding a crystal globe, the Imperial Sigil. Topper steps through the gate, but Jinoz rides through on his horse and into the Imperial Throne Room. The horse's hooves shatter the mosaic that covers the floor of the hall as Lazine herself looks on from her throne made of twisted bone. Dismounting, Jinoz notices that Lazine has changed little in the seven years since he last saw her at Mox Hold. The Empress makes reference to the conversation between the young Jinoz and the commander back on Mox Hold, noting that he ignored the man's advice about living quietly. Jinoz is led from the throne room by Topper, in search of Adjunct Lorne. As soon as they leave the throne room, Topper inquires about the Empress's words to Jinoz, but Jinoz refrains from elaborating. Jinoz meets with the adjunct, and is told that he will have a few days before being officially reassigned to her service. Jinoz asks if they will abandon the pursuit of the truth of what happened at Kokan, and she responds that it is trail they must not follow too closely, however follow it they will. He is told by adjunct Lorne to visit his family's estate in the meantime and get some rest. The gate is guarded by the veteran Gamut, whom Paran had not met before. Jinoz then encounters his sister Tavor. Chapter 2 Pale Two years have passed since the Atkokan massacre. The chapter opens just after the bloody end of the siege of Pale as Tattersail watches the Black Morinth marching into the city to exact their vengeance on Pale and Herlock lies dying, missing his legs. Several Brie burners arrive. Whiskey Jack and the bridge burners had been tasked with undermining the walls of Pale for three years and most were killed as the siege ended and tunnels collapsed. Of the 1,400 bridge burners, only about 35 to 40 survived after the last day. Tatrin stopped the remaining bridge burners from trying to dig out their comrades. Tattersail remembers back to earlier in the morning. She is waking up with Callow, when Herlock summons them both with magic. Arriving at the command tent, Tatrin and Herlock are already there with Dijek appearing moments later. Dijik explains that they will be attacking Moon's spawn directly, causing Herlock to become paranoid and suspicious. The High Fist explains that a claw has already been dispatched to distract the city's mages while their assault begins. Recalling the poem Anomandaris by Fisher Keltath, Tattersail, Kalo and Herlock determine that the Lord of Moon's spawn must be Anomandarake himself, a wielder of the elder magic of Kirold Galine. Tatian explains that Blurden discovered information in the ancient tome Gothos folly regarding the Teast and I which may aid them in battle. The final battle of the Siege of Pale begins with Tatian on a hill directly underneath Moon's spawn, Nightchill, Blurden, and Acaronis on another hill further away, and Tattersail, Herlock, and Callow on the furthest hill. Tatian makes the first attack on Moon's spawn which disperses the great ravens who had lain there to roost into the sky. The other mages also began their assault, but are unexpectedly attacked from behind. These attacks lead to Herlock being cut in two, Callow sacrificing himself to defend Tattersail, Nightchill being torn in two by a Kenrila demon, 
and Ikerini's death from an ice-based magical attack. The numerous sorceress attacks originating from Moon's spawn are deflected by Tashrin onto the defenseless second and fifth armies situated on the plain, killing thousands in very little time. After sustaining heavy damage, Moon's spawn retreats south, heading towards the Talon Mountains. Awakened from her gruesome reverie by the nearby bridge burners, Herlock forces Tattersail to come to the conclusion that it was Tashrin and not Rake who had purposely tried to kill them. The impact of this shocking conclusion is compounded by her witnessing Quick Ben's use of ancient magic to soul shift Herlock into a puppet's body. When asked by the bridge burners to accept the hidden puppet that has become Herlock, she becomes part of their conspiracy against Tashrin to revenge the murder of so many of their comrades. Agonizing over the soldiers whose deaths she feels responsible for, Tattersail returns to her tent, to find the package she was given by Quick Ben, containing the soul-shifted puppet of Herlock, is moving. Faced with the puppet she is beset with fear and instinctively opens herself to her warren. Tattersail feels a need to conduct a reading of the Deck of Dragons. With Herlock as witness, she plays two cards, the Knight of High House Dark, and Opan, the twin gestures of chance then decides to hold on these which enrages Hairlock. The playing reveals the presence of a spinning coin, only noticed by Tattersail, giving her cautious hope for the future. Chapter 3 Meningal Ocean Captain Peron receives instructions from Topper as he travels by ship to Genabaris. He is to take command of Whiskey Jack's squad because the possessed Sari is in the squad. From Genabaris, Peron flies by green coral to Pale. Pale Tattersail and Bridge Burners. In Pale, the injured Belurden mourns for Nightchill and tells Tattersail that he will soon go out into the Rivy Plain to raise Nightchill's barrow. Whiskey Jack, Kalam, and Quick Ben believe that the Bridge Burners are being set up to be eliminated as part of Lazine's effort to remove the Emperor's old guard. An officer had been Garrett, and they suspect Sari may be the assassin, whether she is a claw or not. Quick Ben and Kalam get Whiskey Jack to agree with their plan to turn the tables, with Herlock as their surprise player. Tattersail conducts a reading of the fatted for Tatrin, with an ascendant reaching through her. She draws, Orb, Virgin of High House Death, Assassin of High House Shadow, Opon with Lady's Head High and Crown. She believes Death's Virgin to be sorry, although somehow the rope is connected, information she does not share with Tatrin. She wants to talk with Whiskey Jack. Peron. Outside Pale, Peron meets up with Tok the Younger, the last claw in the second army who conveys him into the city. Tok comments that Whiskey Jack once commanded the seventh company in seven cities and that the sergeant and Dujek one arm command much loyalty among the Genabakan armies. He also tells Peron that his own claw master was Garrett two days earlier. Peron meets Corporal Picker and Sergeant Ancy then goes to Nobs Inn and meets Hedge, Mallet and Trots from the ninth squad of the Bridge Burners. On his way back to the barracks, he is assassinated by Sari. Shadow Throne appears briefly and notes that something has entered the Warren of Shadow. Chapter 4 Pale Tattersail's Residence Tattersail meets with Whiskey Jack, Quick Ben, Fiddler and Exclaw Kalam. Herlock is declared insane from his use of the Warren of Chaos the paths between Warrens though Quick Ben thinks he is still in control of the puppet. The Ninth Squad is going to Deruhistan and must use Herlock as their link with Tattersail. They know something of the slaughter in Itkokan and suspect Sari is possessed. Kalam hints at a connection between Shadow Throne and Cotillion and the disappearance of Kellant and Dancer given the apparent conflict between the House of Shadow and Empress Lazine. They use Hairlock to investigate Shadow's connection to Sari. The bridge burners leave to investigate, when Fiddler has one of his bad feelings Hood's Gate. Peron lies before Hood's Gate when Opan, the twins of Chance interfere. Peron's sword is named Chance. The twins agree with the gatekeeper that another life will be taken in place of Peron's. Opan leaves before Shadow Throne and two hounds of Shadow arrive. Shadow Throne allows Peron to live so he can be followed to discover who opposes Shadow. Peron wanders through his own memories which seem to be manipulated by someone. He then hears the voices of Picker and Ancy who have found his body and, when they realize he still lives, call for the healer. Tattersail's Residence The guards outside the Malaysian compound let the bridge burners through who are carrying a body. 
Kalam warns them to get out of the way should a woman follow them. Tattersail, meanwhile, is laying the deck, using a spiral pattern for a reading. The first card is Mason of High House Death. Midway is Knight of High House Dark. A confrontation between Shadow and Rake is predicted. Quick Ben then appears by Warren, announcing the imminent arrival of the others. Palace sees Turret. Whiskey Jack and Fiddler discuss Tattersail. Fiddler then tells Whiskey Jack that something will be unleashed that night. Dijik appears and questions the sergeant about Peron's disappearance. He then confesses to Whiskey Jack that there is pressure to disband the bridge burners. Whiskey Jack realizes the plan to infiltrate Deruhastan is designed to get the ninth killed. Dujic tells him that if they somehow survive they can leave. Fiddler responds and implies that ten thousand soldiers are ready to rebel if Dujic wishes. Whiskey Jack also implies that should the Empress decide to outlaw Dujic, they would stand with him. Tattersail's Residence The injured Peron is taken to Tattersail's residence. Kalam, Quick Ben and Tattersail await Hairlock who is pursued through the Warrens by hounds. Mallet confirms that Peron should be dead but lives because of ascendant intervention. They ask Tattersail to care for Peron since they are about to leave for Derivaston. The bridge burners can wait no longer and leave although Hairlock has not yet appeared. Palace sees Turret. The Morinthar arriving to pick up the ninth however half the squad is still missing. Whiskey Jack unsuccessfully tries to engage one of the flyers in conversation. Instead, he then observes the quarrel. The rest of the squad arrive, giving Sari a hard time. Dujic observing this, questions Whiskey Jack about Sari but stops when he sees the expression on Whiskey Jack's face. Tattersail's Residence The Hound of Shadow Gear pursues Hairlock to Tattersail's quarters, killing the guards on his way in. Tattersail barely manages to deflect the first attack. Hairlock then tries to take Gear's soul but Peron appears and lunges at the Hound wounding gear before he flees into the warren of shadow. Herlock threatens both Peron and Tattersail, but Tattersail calls his bluff realizing that there's nothing that Herlock can do against them without exposing himself to Tatron's attentions. Peron and Tattersail both hear a spinning coin. Chapter 5 Deruhistan Krupp In his dream world, Krupp walks westwards out of Deruhistan. He is small, round, loquacious and thinks highly of himself. He reaches an inn on top of a hill, after having walked for quite a while, that has fallen into disrepair and finds a few people inside who, by the looks of it, are beggars. He speaks with these other inhabitants of his dream that possibly represent his doubts, gifts, virtues, hungers or humility. He knows that Opon's coin spins. He then decides to join in the game and try to influence the events that are to follow. On Deruhistan's side, and also in the meantime, tried to help his friends. Crocus Younghand Crocus Younghand infiltrates the Darl estate near Kroles Temple and steals valuables from the room of Chalice Darl, a seventeen-year-old maiden. He sneaks a look at the sleeping girl who is naked from the waist up. The assassin Taylor Crawford, who is patrolling the rooftops for his guild, is injured by an unknown assailant and attempts to turn the game and ambush them from Kroles Belfry. Crocus is returning across the rooftops when he is fired at by Taylor who mistakes the thief for his hunter but Crocus hears a coin drop and bends to pick it up and the shot misses. Crawford's assailant is actually behind him and Crawford is killed by the cloaked assassin who is then joined by two others who descend from the sky. Crocus flees through the city from the three assassin mages who have now started in his pursuit. He uses the thief lines, similar to cloth lines but much stronger established by the thieves in the past, which crisscrossed the city, to escape. He briefly meets his uncle Mamet, and goes through the window in the house jumping to a tree, onto another building then down onto a tarpaulin before reaching the relative safety of the Phoenix Inn. The three hunters convene outside the inn. They are at war with the Guild of Assassins and don't want witnesses. Even though they are ready to invade the inn to take Crocus out, the leader of the three decides that someone has intervened on his behalf and besides, some rumors about them might be useful. They then leave. Chapter 6 Deruhistan Crone The great raven crone flies from moon's spawn down to Deruhistan. Circle Breaker At Despot's Barbican, the spy Circle Breaker witnesses a secret meeting between Councilman Turban or and Councilman Fader. Barak 
The alchemist Beric receives a missive from Circle Breaker, who calls himself a servant of the eel, telling him about the meeting the spy observed between Or and Fader. Crone appears at the alchemist's window, surprising him, since his wards should have warned him of her arrival. He lets the great raven in, and she tells him that her lord Anamander Rake wishes a meeting with him to which he agrees. At that moment, his servant Rold announces the unexpected arrival of Turban or Beric accedes to Crone's request that she witness the meeting and give her assessment. Ralik Nam Ralik Nam eavesdrops on a conversation between Lady Simtal and Councilman Lim at the Simtal estate. He is lying in wait to assassinate Simtal in order to facilitate the return of a friend. Beric Crone has turned into the shape of a hunting dog and observes as Turban or attempts to convince Beric to support a proclamation of neutrality by the Council to the Empire. Beric refuses Orr's advances, telling the Councilman that he holds no influence with the mages of Daruhistan and correctly interprets Orr's proclamation of neutrality to be a betrayal of Daruhistan to Lazine with Orr himself coming out on top as a high fist. Orr leaves in anger. Ralik a far more elaborate plan for vengeance against Simtal enters Ralik's mind, seemingly coming from nowhere, and he assassinates Lim instead of her. After he has escaped from the estate, clan leader Ocelot notifies Ralik of an assassin's war on the rooftops that has left all the assassins involved dead. Beric. Crone leaves and Anamander Rake arrives moments later. Rake carries Dragnipur, his two-handed magical sword. He is there to discuss an alliance with the real rulers of Daruhistan, these being the mages with real power, not the bickering councilmen and women. He reveals his city and moon spawn has no mages or warriors they are all with Kaladin brood in the north. He confirms that Tashrin unleashed demons against the other empire mages outside Pale and admits he was taken by surprise by the attack, more so at Tashrin's wanton destruction of his own army. Beric tells Anamander that he would have to discuss this possible alliance with his fellow mages before giving an answer. When Beric inquires about the reason for his apparent abandoning of Pale Rake coldly informs him that Pale's mages went to ground as soon as they heard that the city had been infiltrated by the Claw even though Rake had dispatched these Claws only moments after they had entered. However, since these mages did not help him in the sorceress fight against the mages of the Malazan Empire, he had to withdraw for fear of extensive damage to Moon's spawn. He tells Beric that he has chased down all but the two who fled to Daruhistan and demands their heads or else he will kill them himself. Looking at Dragnipur, Beric shudders and tells him that their heads will be sent to him. Rake harshly laughs and tells him he is a very merciful man. Crocus It is morning in Murillo, Crocus, and Krupp are playing cards in the Phoenix Inn whilst Call is sleeping. Crocus recounts his encounter with the assassins. Crocus senses that Ralik and Murillo are up to something and is unhappy about being left out. He thinks of the girl he robbed but shakes off the image. Chapter 7 Daruhistan In Krupp's dream, he speaks to the elder god Krull who believes he will lose a battle sometime in the future. Circle Breaker waits for the eel's agent to deliver a personal message, a plea for help but he changes his mind and tears up the scroll. Lady Simtal accuses Turban or of wanting to become a high fist of the Empire. They talk about Simtal's ex-husband. She wants or to kill him. Murillo convinces Lady or to get him two invitations to Lady Simtal's fate on Gedaron's Eve. Outside the Or estate, Ralik confronts Crocus and tells him not to rob the Or estate. Crocus leaves and examines Opan's coin more closely. At the Boar's Tears Tavern he speaks with Krupp and retrieves the Darl loot before Krupp can fence it. Krupp examines the coin. Murillo meets with Ralik and they deduce that Crocus is smitten with Chalice Darl. They decide to try to encourage him away from thieving and for the first time in a long time, they both feel hopeful for their friends, and that things might be taking a turn for the better, despite the specter of a Malazan invasion hanging over them. They both comment on Krupp's slipperiness. Outside Beric's estate, noisy road workers create havoc and startle the alchemist. Startled, he spills some ink on a map and the stain spreads southwards all the way to Catlin, and with a shudder, Beric feels it to be a premonition of things to come. Beric then receives one of his informers, who happens to be Krupp. 
Krupp enters and shows Barak a wax copy of Opon's coin which starts to spin faster and faster while the wax melts. Krupp, in a veiled fashion, informs him about this coin from Opon, hinting that things have just gotten far more complicated with the entry of an ascendant into their game. For just a moment, Barak intuits that Krupp is far more than just an informer and feels that he is far more knowledgeable and cleverer than Barak had anticipated him to be. Finally, Barak instructs Krupp and his agents to protect the coin bearer. Chapter 8 Deruhistan Whiskey Jack is bidding farewell to the Morinth who conveyed him and his squad to the north shore of Lake Azza. He is told that, from the Morinth, he will always be able to count on assistance. The squad has been supplied with plenty of Morinth munitions as well as a fishing boat by the Green Morinth. Whiskey Jack informs his squad that they will implement his own plan instead of the Empire's plan to infiltrate and bring down Durahustin. They will make their way to the city disguised as fishermen. Sari claims to have a knowledge of fishing. In the meantime, Quick Ben performs a magic ritual using his warren, meets Hairlock in the caverns of chaos on the spar of Andiai. The puppet updates the wizard about events in Pale, about Tashrin and his suspicions about Tattersail. Tattersail seems to be suffering from a fever, and in a role reversal, is being taken care of by Peran, who also seems to be protecting her from Herlock himself. Herlock berates Quick Ben for not telling him that there are gods involved. He then insinuates that, as a consequence, he might already be taken over by one, which makes Quick Ben question whether this could be true. Herlock seems to be growing increasingly powerful and insane from his use of the Warren of Chaos. He starts muttering something to himself, tittering and musing about the sword chance that has so injured the Hound of Shadow, Gear. Quick Ben considers that Herlock's increasing insanity might remove him from Quick Ben's control. He charges Herlock to pursue Tashrin's plans then sends him flying with a kick, hoping the abrupt dismissal will skew the puppet's recollection of their meeting. When Quick Ben returns, he proposes something to Whiskey Jack and Kalam which leaves the other two shaken. Whiskey Jack organizes getting the fishing boat ready. As other than Sari, none of the bridge burners know anything about fishing or boating. The squad is nervous about the crossing. Chapter 9 Rivy Plain Tok the Younger, on his way to meeting Adjunct Lorne, comes across the site of a battle. He counts eight dead Malays and Marines of the Jakotakan elites, all cut to pieces. The enemy dead are of the Ilgers clan of the Barghast, which explains why the Marines fared so badly. The Ilgers, amongst the strongest who are allied with the Crimson Guard, are a long way from their base. When Tok finds the body of a shaman who must have been the leader, he realizes that the man's magic was negated during the battle, leading to his death from a sword wound to the throat. Finding a trail made by survivors of Lorne's party as well as pursuing Barghast, he mounts and follows. The adjunct and her remaining two guards are making a stand but are not faring well with both Jakotakans mortally wounded. Lorne is saved at the last moment by the arrival of the clan and mass Onos Tulin and that of Tak who between them dispatched the last of the Barghast. Lorne is angry that the clan had not met up with her days earlier as had been expected. Tak and the adjunct then ride double back to Pale, leaving Onos to make his own way there. Onos makes a cryptic remark that they are on the right track, and somehow, Tok gets a chilly feeling that they aren't talking about their journey to Duruhistan. Pale. In Pale, about six days have passed since his encounter with the Hound Gear and Paran is confused about recent events. Tattersail awakens from her fever sleep and finds him pacing the room. They exchange what little information about the current situation they have and talk about how Paran got there. Tok and Lone arrive in Pale. Soldiers are disgruntled about the dismantling of armies and the rumor of the bridge burners being retired. The adjunct meets with Dijek and they discuss local politics and the military campaign. He will get reinforcements in the spring. Dijek asks if it will be possible to reverse the landings but then seems to do some mental calculations, leaving Lorne with the impression that the whole question is now academic as far as the commander is concerned. The adjunct recognizes Tattersail's name, and it brings back bad memories. She asks for the sorceress to be included on the guest list for the formal dinner that evening. Tashrin storms in asking why there has been a convenient fire in the library of public records removing all the recorded names of nobility. The plan had been to cull the nobility. 
Dujic laconically tells him that he is sorry to hear that and that his staff will assist Taishan's investigation. Lorne interrupts, taking Taishan to task about his mismanagement, and asks Dujic to invite Tattersail, thus making Taishan uncomfortable and earning Dujic's respect for her maneuvering. Lorne then has a private meeting with Taishan where she passes on the displeasure of the Empress with the unsubtle way Taishan handled the attack on Moon's spawn. Their discussion reveals that the Empress is getting rid of the old guard and that Taishan is helping her in that. Dujek, however, is one of the exceptions and is not to be touched. However, it would seem that they are intent on removing Whiskey Jack. Taishan informs Lorne that Opan have entered the fray and might be involving themselves in events in Duruhistan. When Tattersail receives her invitation for dinner, she realizes from Peran's reaction that he is working for the adjunct and knew she was coming. At dinner Lorne reminds Tattersail of the events in the Mouse Quarter in Malice City. After the mage Cadre lost control Lorne's parents were forced into plague-ridden caverns and died. Lorne is sure that Tattersail is the sorceress responsible for their death and almost asks for a court to be convened to see Tattersail executed. The situation is diffused by Dujek and Tatrin who remind Lorne that she is the adjunct and has to leave behind her personal feelings. Both Taishan and Dujek agree that the both of them, along with the Empress, are more than responsible for the above-mentioned events. Lorne lets the personality of the adjunct reassert itself. The company then discusses Shadow Throne and Opan's involvement in mortal affairs. Events seem to be focusing on Duruhistan. Tattersail is shaken by the encounter but has her morale subtly strengthened by Tak who is also present. Peran delivers a message from Herlock to Tattersail. The puppet suspects the clan Amass is involved in the adjunct's mission. Peron reveals to Tattersail that his mission was to find Sari. She believes that the adjunct's mission is to also kill Whiskey Jack and the Ninth Squad, but Peron is skeptical. Adjunct Lorne leaves pale and is joined by Ono's Tulin. She names him Tool. Tool reveals much about the Amass. In particular that the year of the 300th millennium approaches, at which time the diaspora ends. Rivy Plain. Crone flies northwards over the Rivy Plain to the summons of Kaladin Brood. Chapter 10. Pale. At an inn in Pale, Tak and Peran meet and Tak convinces Peran that the adjunct's mission is not isolated to Sari. Peran tells Tak that, as far as he knew their only target was Sari, and that he could not allow the adjunct to harm the soldiers he commanded. They decide to catch up to Tattersail who has already left for Duruhistan to warn Whiskey Jack. Rivy Plain Unbeknown to Tattersail, Tool has cast a barrier with his elder powers which affects the warrens used within that area. As a consequence, Tattersail is exhausted from traveling by her warren THYR and is eventually forced to abandon that path. When she emerges on the Rivy Plain she is confronted by Belurden. Belurden tells her that Tatrin has ordered her arrest and asks her to come with him. Tattersail asks Belurden what information his investigations into the scrolls of Gotho's folly had given him. He replies that they spoke of a barrow that the Jag Hut had created for a tyrant that had enslaved the land around him for three thousand years, once he had been subjugated. Tattersail then calls him a fool and tries to convince him that Tatrin and the adjunct's mission is to raise that Jag Hut tyrant. However, the Thelemon refuses to believe the Empire would raise the tyrant. He believes they are preventing anyone else from accessing the barrow for nefarious purposes. Just before they clash and both are caught in a massive conflagration, Tattersail considers whether the preservation spells she placed on the remains of Nightchill might be her way out. From a distance, Tool identifies a number of warrens opened by Tattersail and Belurden, including Starveld Demelane, the first elder warren. He also senses a new presence, something having been born. Peran and Tok come across the bodies of Belurden and Tattersail. Tok finds tracks of a childlike being heading northeast. Peran, visibly shaken by the death of his lover, vows vengeance against the adjunct. Black Dog Forest Crone reports to Kaladin Brood in the Black Dog Forest about events on the Rivy Plain and Duruhistan. Brood's forces are winning against the Empire. It would seem that the Barghast and the Crimson Guard trapped five legions of the Gold Morinth in a risky pincer move destroying two of them in the process. Brood's second-in-command, Collier, seems to think it was just luck, and Brood seems to agree. 
Crone mentions the possibility of Opon getting involved if Rake should kill the coin bearer and Brood arranges for the coin bearer to be protected. Two days after Tattersail's battle with Belurden, Crone survives an encounter with Herlock who has been incinerating great ravens with his Chaos Warren as he heads towards the Rohestan. Rivi Plain. Tool and the adjunct witness the flight of Crone. The adjunct deduces that the flight of the raven has nothing to do with them. Tool takes on a practical hands-on approach to caution and warns Lorne about complacency against unknown powers. Chapter 11. Deruhistan. Krupp. In his dream, Krupp travels backwards in time, and again encounters Krull as well as the Amas Pranchol, the White Fox, and an unnamed Rivi woman from the present day. The Talon Warren has birthed Tattersail into Nightchill's body. A soul shift takes place, and the Rivi woman gives birth to the Tattersail child. Prancho voices regret that he will not see the child as a grown up, however, Krull assures him he will, though not as he is now, but as a Tlan amass bonecaster, and it will be 300,000 years before this happens. Prior to having this dream, Krupp has left Barrack's estate and notices the group of workmen outside. That group of workers is Whiskey Jack's squad, who are masquerading as road workers in order to plant mines at major intersections. With a start, Krupp identifies a muttered curse as Malazan and wonders who now is amongst them. Bridge Burners Sari mentions to Whiskey Jack that somehow the man is very important to the mission. Whiskey Jack asks her to investigate. During their conversation, Whiskey Jack asks Sari if Krupp is a talent or a seer. Sari is troubled by the word seer. She is visibly rocked and seems to go off balance, which Whiskey Jack finds odd, as she has shown Rock's solid composure in all situations. Meanwhile, as she melts into the crowd, following Krupp, there is a storm going off in Sari's head. She seems to remember something about a seer dying, and a part of her brain mourns that death, whilst the other clamors for identification of the seer. Meanwhile Cotillion fights back for control until he reasserts himself. She follows Krupp to the Phoenix Inn and identifies him as an adept. Crocus Mammoth tells Crocus about the rumor of a Jad Hut Barrow in the Gadrobi Hills, the rumor on which Deruhistan was founded. Sorry. Krupp notices Sari following him and has words with a thug outside the Phoenix Inn. The thug initially just tries to stop Sari from going inside but when he suggests a tryst down the alley and threatens her with violence if she doesn't come with him quietly, Sari knives him in the right eye. Crocus comes upon the body moments later and shouts the news in the inn that someone has murdered Chert. Mies and Irilta surmise what has happened but tell Sari that they will keep quiet, with Mies describing Chert as a pig. Sari becomes aware that Crocus notices her blood-stained dagger and that he knows she murdered Chert. Crocus then unwittingly drops Opon's coin on the bar when he is asked to pay for the drink he has just ordered and the coin just keeps on spinning, emanating power. Sari realizes that she has quite by chance come across Opon's coin holder. She knows that she should kill Crocus, both as a witness to her murder of Chert and for being the coin bearer but knows that she won't. Quick Ben and Kalam Kalam is having no luck in contacting the Guild of Assassins to offer a contract. Quick Ben asks him to ward his inert body as he prepares to travel the Warrens. Phoenix Inn At the Phoenix Inn, Ralic, Crocus, and Eurilio join Krupp's table and the inebriated call says five black dragons live in Moon's spawn. Quick Ben and Kalam Quick Ben travels the Warren of Chaos then moves into the Warren of Shadow requesting an audience with its lord, Shadowthrone. Chapter 12. Deruhistan. Krupp. In Mammoth's study, Krupp reads from Aladart's realm compendium about the crippling and chaining of an unknown god and the inhabitants of Moon's spawn, five black dragons and one red, Solana who helped in that chaining. This seems to confirm what Kull said about there being five black dragons in Moon's spawn, and Krupp is left wondering how Kull came across this particular piece of information. Mammoth asks Krupp if he has found what he was looking for, and what it was precisely. Krupp skirts around the question, saying he was looking for his grandmother's name, and thanks the scholar for his understanding of the need to be circumspect. They then talk about the odd behavior Crocus has displayed of late. Barrack communicates with Mammoth via Warren to summon Krupp. Mammoth himself seems distracted by what he has been told, and says he has some research to do. 
Meanwhile at Barrick's estate, Crone arrives and at the behest of Anamanda Rake tells Barrick what she saw on the rivy plain. A puppet, its power evil, pursuing some other power headed towards the Gadroby Hills, seeking something there. Barrick is visibly shaken and he tells the great raven of a jag-hut tyrant supposedly imprisoned there in a barrow, towards which the searchers, presumably Malazan, are probably headed. Barrick tells Crone that whilst there have been a lot of exploration around the barrow, the exact entrance is not known. Barrick gives Crone the location of a standing stone from where a search would be started but says that he needs to consult with a colleague who is an authority on the subject before saying more. He refuses to give further information since he does not quite trust Rake, having only talked to him once. Should the barrow be opened, it would unleash a power that could very easily destroy the city of Daruhistan and Barak doesn't want to share this information until he is sure of Rake's intentions. Crone angrily tells him he will be kept informed about further events if her lord deems it necessary. Barak and Crone both express a displeasure with the other for not communicating enough. Once Crone has left, Barak then contacts Mammoth, the communication witnessed earlier. Quick Ben. Four hounds escort Quick Ben to Shadowkeep where he has a meeting with Shadowthrone. Quick Ben admits that he knew the name of the hounds as he was once an acolyte of Shadow. Leaving the cult is considered a crime punishable by death which means he is now marked for assassination. He proposes a deal knowing that Shadow Throne loves deals. Quick Ben will deliver Herlock since he attacked Gear and tried to take away his soul. In return, the mark of assassination is to be removed from him, and he will be the one to decide the time and place when and where the hounds would attack Herlock and destroy him. Shadow Throne asks why he shouldn't destroy this former acolyte right now. Quick Ben insists on the deal being sealed before answering the question. As he activates a recall spell, his words and actions lead to Shadow Throne recognizing him. He screams, It is you! Delat! You shape shifting bastard! But Quick Ben is already out of reach. Krupp. Krupp arrives at barracks and assures the alchemist, who is in an unusually foul mood, that he continues to protect the coin bearer and still has no news of any Malaysian infiltration. He then passes on a message from the eel telling Barak to look to the streets to find those he seeks. Barak asks if Krupp knows anything about the mysterious eel and Krupp relays that the man must have hundreds of agents working for the good of the city and that apparently Turban or is hunting them as he suspects them of running his schemes. Barak instructs Krupp to take his friends and the coin bearer and observe anything unusual in the Gadroby Hills, possibly a foreign work party. Ralik is to kill the coin bearer if his influence turns against them. Quick Ben. Quick Ben's soul returns to his body, and he tells Kalam about the success of his mission. Sari arrives and says that she has found an assassin at the Phoenix Inn. She admits that she found them because she sensed Quick Ben's power. The mage thinks that it wasn't because of cracks in his shield but because he was linked to Shadow briefly which means his suspicions about Sari are correct. He just congratulates her on her natural talent then lets her go. He tells Kalam that had he attacked the girl he would likely be dead now. Ralik Ralik observes an assassin enter the inn and tells Ocelot. He is ordered to lead Kalam to Tarlo's warehouse. However, when he comes back in to lead Kalam to the said place, Kalam is already gone. Crocus. Crocus decides to return the Dal loot. Chapter 13. Daruhistan. Kalam. Once the guild assassin has left the bar room of the Phoenix Inn in Daruhistan, Kalam goes upstairs to a room where Quick Ben is seated in a magic circle, ensconced in a ritual. As Kalam assembles his goat's foot arbalest, Quick tells him that he has prepared two spells, one enabling Kalam to float the other making most magic visible to him. Quick Ben himself will be all but invisible. Kalam says that they may well be led into a trap but that the guild will want to find out their purpose first, and things should be okay from then on. As they follow Ralik to the harbor area, the two exchange some cynical observations about themselves and their roles within the empire. They arrive at a place where they can observe Ralik overlooking a warehouse courtyard. Ralik Ralik Nam knows he is being observed. He tells Ocelot who is in the shadows of the courtyard below that he suspects that there is more than one and that Majri is involved. Ocelot believes it to be a case of the stranger being better than Ralik. 
he tells Ralik that his role is over and that now he, Ocelot, and the other guild assassins will put an end to the assassins' war of the recent days for which they blamed the Malazan Empire. A demon. A dog-sized demon is observing the rooftops at the behest of his master. He sees men and women closing in on two men, one a mage. At that moment he comes under attack and as he struggles to survive the onslaught by an assassin mage, another eleven figures drop from the sky and pass them, heading for those on the rooftops below. The demon narrowly escapes but the assassin mage does not pursue, joining his fellow assassins instead. As he flees, he sees eleven of them raise their crossbows and begin a slaughter of the men and women below whilst another makes for the two men who they were heading for. Kalam Kalam sees two glowing shapes touching down onto the roof behind Ralik, then he and Quick Ben find themselves under attack. He feels the first of the assassins touch down and immediately rolls aside avoiding a bolt fired at him. He scampers away to a rooftop edge where he turns the ambush, gravely injuring the assassin. Meanwhile another assassin, who is only a few steps behind, is charging Kalam. This second assassin uses her warrant to disappear but Quick Ben sends bolts of magic her way, eventually revealing her, just before she attacks Kalam. Kalam manages to evade the Andi, and delivers knife wounds on his opponent but at the cost of getting injured himself. Scanning the lower rooftops, Kalam can see bodies in various places, but no sign of Ralik or his attackers. He recalls hearing two booms and is concerned that Quick Ben has come under attack by one of the mage assassins. Ralik Ralik is hit by a quarrel between the shoulder blades, but his concealed armor saves him, and he is able to turn round and fire a quarrel at the assassin attacking him. A second assassin's quarrel then ricochets off his upper chest leaving his right arm numb. That assassin then disappears as he can see Ocelot arriving despite the clan master being cloaked by a magic spell. The body of the first assassin also disappears before they can investigate. Ralik is certain that the stranger whom he led to the warehouse had nothing to do with it, and as he looks up to where he suspects him to be, he sees someone being attacked with magic. Ocelot and Ralik decide to get out. Sorry. Sari's intuition tells her that Crocus is important for some reason, and she follows him rather than Krupp. As she trails Crocus to the Darl estate, she is beset by thoughts of a seer but does not know why. Reaching the estate, she kills the lone guard in the garden and waits. Crocus. Chalice wakes up as Crocus returns the loot. They have a long conversation, and he tells her that he will be in the line of her suitors one day. They hear voices approach, and Crocus leaves in a hurry. He is unnerved to see Sari in the garden, watching his departure. Kalam. Quick Ben and his attacker appear in front of Kalam. Before he can help, Quick knocks out his assailant. As they flee, he comes back to his feet, and two more appear. Quick Ben releases a Corvala demon named Pearl to cover their escape. The three teased Andii do not flee. Pearl asks who is sending him to fight and Quick Ben gives him his full name, Benadea Fondilat, a name which Pearl recognizes from a list naming the dead high mages of seven cities who fell to the empire. Another six Andii arrive, the last of whom strikes fear in both of them. Pearl tells Quick Ben that the latter is sending him to his death and that he can only guarantee a small delay to cover their escape. Quick Ben and Kalam promptly take to the rooftops to disappear. Ralik Ralik is feeling circumspect about the career choices he has made, resigning himself to the fact that his future can only lead him to a darker path, and that avenging Kal may be his last act of humanity. He spots Crocus approaching and pulls him aside, warning him to stay off the rooftops. He tells Crocus to report to his Uncle Mammoth that there is a claw in the city, as well as others who are killing everyone in sight. He then tells the thief not to further pursue his current, criminal path. Murillo arrives in time to hear the ending of that conversation and commends Ralik for trying. He also tells Ralik about the mission they are about to undertake with Krupp but Ralik says he has other things to do and won't come along. Rake the T. Standii assassin Surrod reports the injuries and losses they have taken to Anamander Rake. They believe there may have been a claw and a high mage. The surviving T. Standii return to Moon Spawn to mourn the death of the fallen Andii comrade. Whiskey Jack. 
Whiskey Jack is pondering the changes the introduction of Morinth munitions have made to the way the Malaysian saboteurs operate, as he observes Fiddler playing one of his new games, then loses himself in thoughts of his youth. Quick Ben brings the injured Kalam in, and whilst Mallet treats him, he reports their encounter with the Teast and the Assassins. Whiskey Jack and Quick think that the Teast are taking out the guild to prevent them making a deal with the Malaysians. They conclude that they need to find those who really run the city. Sorry. Sorry has felt the death of the demon and watched Crocus being told off by Ralic. She ponders what Crocus' role is, whether he is conducting an affair with Chalice Darl and, given the involvement of Opan, what the political implications might be. Having heard Murillo talk about Krub's mission, she decides to follow them and kill Crocus. Barak. Rake visits Barak and brings the small demon which is Barak's, who had been following him. Barak and Rake have an argument about whether the guild master Vorkan would take up the offer of a contract from the Empire. Neither is willing to completely trust the other. Barak thinks Daruhistan is just another pawn in Rake's game of opposition to the Empress and is angry that Rake is taking action without consulting them. He tells Rake that Vorkan is a high mage and possibly stronger than the other members of the Torrid Cabal. Rake reveals that he used Dragnapur on the Korvala demon who had been unleashed. Krupp. Krupp dreams and Krull tells him of Tattersail's accelerated growth and Rake's alliance with Barak and the Torrid Cabal. The Elder God warns him of the Amtos Felic magic from the Jag Hut and the Gadroby Hills. Chapter 14 Gadroby Hills Lorn. Tool and the adjunct enter the Gadroby Hills. Tool explains that the Telan and Amtos Felic Warrens are of the same flavor, hence he will be able to find the Jag Hut Barrow where others could not. He was chosen to lead her because he is clanless and expendable, and so the Jag Hut Tyrant cannot enslave him nor can he be a conduit for the Jag Hut to enslave his kin since he doesn't have any. He tells her that releasing the tyrant is a gamble, and that it relies on Anamander Rake using his sword Dragnapur to enslave the Jag Hut which in turn would weaken the Son of Darkness significantly. From what Tool tells her, Lorn learns that the Teast and I came to this world from another, and that the first war in Starveld Demolane is the home of dragons. Murillo Krupp call Murillo and Crocus journey out to the Gadroby Hills from Duruhistan. They are riding mules except for Call, who possesses a horse. Upon Crocus' incessant inquiries about where they are going, what their mission is, why he has not been given a sword and so on, Murillo and Krupp eventually reveal that they are collecting information for Beric. They are riding mules rather than horses because Krupp made a bad deal with the stabler. Murillo disdainfully comments that the compensation Krupp got will never be seen by Beric. Krupp tells Crocus that they are looking for information about what the ravens, who have been circling around for days, are actually observing. He belittles the use of swords and other such weapons, saying that knowledge is what matters, not clumsy tools like Murillo's rapier or Kal's sword and armor. Sorry. Sari follows Krupp's group out of the city and moves into the Shadow Warren as soon as she finds herself alone on the road. She senses danger ahead for the group. Lorne. Tool finds the barrow marker. Upon expressing her doubts that it is indeed the barrow, Tool, with a hint of anger in his voice, tells her that the barrow has been present since before ice covered this place, when the Rivy Plain was still a sea. He proposes that they'll stay the night, and he'll open the barrow at dawn. Lorne thinks that humans fear the Jag Hut tyrant because he became like one, only even better at enslaving and destroying everything. Talk the Younger Peran and Tak are a few days behind the adjunct having caught up by taking a shortcut through the Talon forest. Since emerging from the woods, they have found their trail littered with dead ravens, killed with sorcery. The killings seem to follow the trail of the adjunct. Tak is resigned to the fact that Peran is fueled by vengeance, and is not thinking his plans through logically. Tak is particularly worried about the amass accompanying the adjunct, and he does not think that Peran's god touch sword chance will be enough since the amass has access to an elder warren. Tak briefly sees a small shape moving so fast that it is hardly visible. He realizes that what he saw must have been warren work and warns Peran that they are likely to face an ambush by warren. Peran seems eager for a fight. Chapter 15 Daruhistan Gadroby Hills. Quick Ben Peran. 
In a hut, likely in Deruhistan, Quick Ben has performed another ritual and is spying on Hairlock. As Kalam is still not fully recovered, Trotz is guarding his back instead. Close to the Gadrobi Hills, Herlock attacks Peran and Tok. Before Peran can react, the puppet throws Tok into an unknown warren. Peran faces off with Herlock, the latter vowing a protracted painful death for Peran, because he dared interfere with his attack on the hound gear, back and pale. As they are about to engage, they hear the howling of hounds in the distance. Watching the initial ambush, Quick Ben, astounded at the captain's presence, uses a piece of Saris bedroll to cast a message via her to Cotillion, knowing that she is indeed possessed by the rope. He feels the man's presence enter his mind and tells him to pass the exact location of Hairlock on to Shadow Throne, this being part of his end of the deal he made. Lorne. Lorne explores the hills and comes across Call and his group unexpectedly. She attacks them instantly without thinking. Lorne injures Call with a slash across his thigh, cutting an artery, which causes a lot of blood loss. Murillo fights with his rapier, wounding Lorne on her shoulder, but eventually Lorne hits him on his head with the flat of her blade, whilst Krupp is unable to access his warren due to her otateral sword, and in his surprise gets bowled back from his mule and landing on his head, falls unconscious. Crocus gets ready to fight with Lorne, but first tries to ask her to back off since they don't know her and mean her no harm. They agree to stay away from each other on the condition that Crocus tends to the wounded for that evening, and leaves for Deruhistan the next day without troubling her. Sari. Having delivered the message to Shadowthrone, Sari closes in on Crocus and his group, preparing to ambush them. They disappear over the crest of a hill and moments later, she hears the sound of fighting which also involves the unveiling of Otateral. From the top of the hill, she sees that most of the group is on the ground and Crocus is talking to the adjunct, whom Sari recognizes. Once Lorne has left, Sari moves forward to kill Crocus. Peran Quick Ben. Declining Peran's request to engage with him now, Herlock opens his warren to escape the hounds. At that moment, Quick Ben cuts the strings connecting him with Herlock and the puppet loses control over its limbs. Peran refuses Herlock's request to lift him into the open warren. Moments later, all seven hounds of shadow arrive and destroy the puppet, easily ripping it apart. They then turn their attention on Peran, four of them proceeding to surround Peran, who eagerly awaits their attack with his sword chance in his hands. Anamanda Rake arrives and confronts the hounds. He and Peran have a conversation wherein Peran reveals that he was being attacked by the hounds because he showed mercy, having saved the hound gear from being possessed by Hairlock. Rake says that Peran should always finish what he started. Peran asks Rake if he is someone to be feared and Rake replies that the answer is in the hesitation that the hounds have shown so far. At that point, the hounds all attack at once, in a blur. Anamanda responds by killing Doan and Gonrod with Dragnapur and forces Shadow Throne to recall Cotillion. He asks Shadow Throne to keep away from matters of the Empire and leave the Empress to him. Shadow Throne responds by recalling Cotillion, forcibly extracting him, then withdraws. Listening to the exchange, Peran realizes that he is dealing with Anamander Rake, the Knight of High House Dark, and that in her divinations, Tattersail had predicted this very moment when Shadow and Dark would meet and blood would be spilled. Having finished with Shadow Throne, Rake discusses Peran's circumstances and concludes that he himself is no longer Opun's pawn but that his sword still is. Rake advises Peran to get rid of the sword or break it if his luck ever turns then leaves with Crone who has arrived to warn Rake of another tool of Opon. Peran. Peran turns around, reflecting on the mess his vendetta has gotten talk into. He feels that he has simply been responding to events and been blaming everything on others. Lost in thoughts, he touches the blood of one of the dead hounds and finds himself in a completely different place where the ground is flat and infertile and the sky is dark. A hound attacks him almost immediately, pinning his arms with its claws and taking his throat between its jaws, ready to kill. Instead, it pauses and releases Peran, throwing him away and inadvertently into the path of a wheel. Peran is dragged away and onto his feet by an unknown stranger who is chained by a collar to a gigantic wagon like all others he sees around. The two speak briefly, and the man informs him that he is in the Warren of Dragnipur, 
where beings exist who have been killed by Rake's sword. Piran offers to try and free the hounds who have shattered the relative peace of Dragnipur and are disturbing the stranger. He approaches the hounds and asks to examine their collars and chains. He follows the chains all the way to the underside of the wagon, finding no weakness. Piran calls upon Opan through chance. The male twin appears and says the chains are held in Kurog Galine, the gate to the realm of darkness which lies at the center beneath the wagon. Piran uses the twin as bait for the hounds, and at the last moment releases him. The Opan twin disappears whilst Piran throws himself to the ground. The hounds plunge into the portal to Kurog Galine, ostensibly freed from Dragnipur. Piran finds himself back on the plain but the bodies of the two hounds are now gone. Crocus Crocus is tending to Carl's wound when Sari appears. He is terrified as he recognizes her as the girl who killed Shirt and the guardsman at the Dal estate. Carl, however, is able to discern that she is completely disoriented. Crocus tries to speak to the girl and finds out that she seems to be Malazan but can understand and speak Daru, albeit in a broken fashion and that she seems to have lost her memory. Carl tells Crocus to take his horse and take the girl to Mamet immediately as the girl seems to have been previously possessed and the scholar will understand these things better. He convinces Crocus that it might be vital for the welfare of Daruhistan to find out who brought her. Krupp and Murilio will come to very soon and he and they can take care of themselves. Crocus agrees to go. Chapter 16 Gadrobi Hills and Surrounding Area Lorne Lorne regrets having lost control in attacking Crocus' young hand and his friends. She puts it down to her conversations with Tool, which have left her feeling unsettled. Tool helps her see to her wound, then evokes Telan, and they enter the barrow. Tool thinks he recognizes the tyrant held within and that it should not be released, but, like Lorne, that he is compelled to do so. He tells Lorne that, due to what they are about to do and the residual power of the sleeping jag hut, he will be freed of his vows once they have completed their task. He tells her that she is welcome to come with him when he goes in search of answers afterwards. Lorne, suddenly afraid, does not want to find out more and avoids answering. Tool informs her that they are now in a time when the ice above the barrow has not yet melted and that he does not know how much time will have passed once they get back as he has never done this before. Crocus Crocus and the girl are journeying back to Daruhistan, riding double. Crocus feels distracted and hot in the face because a young girl his age is sitting behind him, with her arms around him, as well as because he is wondering if she was in the hills to kill him. She starts a conversation asking him if they are still in the Empire, and how far Ikokin is. Crocus replies that he doesn't know where that is but that they are on Genabakis near Daruhistan. She is excited when he tells her that Daruhistan is a huge city. The girl then asks Crocus to help her find a name for herself since she can't remember her own. He says chalice, but retracts the suggestion immediately, saying he already knows a chalice and snaps at her when she asks if that is his girlfriend. When he says sorry for doing so, she recognizes her former name, but also that it wasn't the one she was given by her father. Back to thinking of names, Crocus sheepishly suggests that of the matron of thieves, Ab Sailor, which she then insists on taking. Krupp and Murillo Krupp and Murillo are hurriedly trying to catch up with Crocus and Absailor. Krupp informs Murillo that Crocus is a tool of Opan and also alludes that he knows of Murillo and Ralik's plans. When he lets slip that a Malaysian Empire sword master bearing an Otaro sword as well as a Tlana mass are in the area, Murillo is unhappy about having left Kal behind, alone. Krupp tells him that he suspects that the Malaisans are looking to find the fabled barrel and that Crocus may be in imminent danger, which means they need to get back to Daruhistan as soon as possible. When asked about his earlier hints, he tells an astonished Murillo that he approves of their plan to reinstate Kal and won't interfere, rather he would help if he could. They then make camp for the night. Paran A couple of days after his encounter with Anamander Rake, Paran finds himself surrounded by a veteran herd and a youth tries to bring him down from his horse, attempts which Paran rebuffs, after which he is attacked by a group of the Rivi. Paran's luck holds and he gets away with minor injuries, however, his sword splits the five lances thrown at him, leaving the herdsman dumbfounded. Paran is then approached by an old woman who looks like a priestess, 
and a child whose mannerisms seem vaguely familiar to Peran. They have a conversation wherein the woman informs him that he has been spared. She asks him to reply honestly if, being a Malaysian, he is an enemy to the Rivi. Peran tells her that he'd rather not have any enemies at all. The child has been constantly communicating with the old woman, and it appears that she is in charge. The woman goes on to tell him that the child says that the one he loved is not dead and that he will see her again. With that they vanish just as Peran realizes that the familiarity of the child is that of Tattersail. After the herd has moved off, Peran, with a shudder remembers the childlike footprints that he and Tak had discovered at the site of the ambush, and wonders if it had all along been her plan to be reborn this way. As he heads towards the Rohistan, Peran encounters Kal and, after initial mutual distrust, they get talking. They both reveal their true backgrounds, Peran telling him he is a Malaysian captain who has deserted and has worked a lot with the claw. Kal feels challenged to tell the truth, informing Peran about his own past as a nobleman who fell in love with a power-hungry woman named Eistel, and how he ended up losing everything to her. Moreover, he has been declared dead by everyone in the city his own friends looking past him as if he didn't exist. Peran shares his philosophy about the trappings of the noble classes, himself being a nobleborn and tells him that, now looking back at his life as a nobleman, he was certain that it was no life at all. To the contrary, he felt absolutely alive now. Carl says that despite all that, he'd rather have it all back which causes Peran to laugh heartily, and even Carl chuckles eventually. Having decided they like each other, they end up sharing a jug of wine by the campfire. Chapter 17 Daruhistan Ralik Nam Ralik is walking towards the Phoenix Inn when he encounters Mies who informs him that somebody is waiting for him inside. Once Ralik has joined him, the stranger identifies himself as an agent for the eel. He informs Ralik that Turban or has hired more hunters, making it more difficult to get close to him. The agent tells Nam that the eel would like to help his and Murillo's cause to return call to the council since a lot of people in the council valued his honesty and integrity and would like to see him return. He then informs Ralik that Ocelot has accepted a contract from Turban or on behalf of Lady Simtal to eliminate call. Ralik thanks the messenger for his information. Once the man has left, Ralik tells Mies to give Murillo a covert message telling him to proceed with the plan but also warning him that their target's eyes are open. Barak. Barak has Anamanda Rake as a guest. The alchemist is extremely troubled that Rake knew the adjunct and the plan and mass were traveling to release the Jag Hut tyrant but did nothing to stop them. They talk about Opan and Shadowthrone's involvement with both of them initially not passing on all they know. Beric voices his misgivings and questions Rake's intentions and the alliance. Rake informs him that the Empress wants the city very much, and intact. To deny her that by destroying the city itself would be too easy. No, rather he would prevent the Empress from taking the city and keep the city intact. Unless, Beric indicates, he ultimately wants to betray Duruhistan. Rake tells him that, as any experienced war leader knows, Treachery opens the doors to treachery from within. Thus, any of the T-Standii might feel free to challenge his powers had he so blithely betrayed his allies. Moreover, some powerful entities such as Kaladin Brood or even Solana might take it upon themselves to exact justice upon him. He ends with saying, Is an honorable cause worth anything these days? Does it matter that we've borrowed it? We fight as well as any man. We die alongside them. Mercenaries of the spirit. And even that is a coin we scarcely value. Why? It doesn't matter why. But we never betray our allies. Rake reveals that a people who have lived fifteen, twenty thousand years have seen so much that nothing really interests them anymore. The T Standii follow his orders, however, Rake feels that he has never had much of a talent to inspire people. Hence they go around fighting and dying for causes not their own and in a land far away from theirs. In a way they are mercenaries of spirit. He would rather not raise moons spawn away from everything because then the Andia would be resigned to history, withering away into nothingness. Rake then explains that a part of Lazine's plan is for the Jag Hut tyrant, once he has been freed, to weaken the Teast Andia to such a state that they can't act anymore. 
Lazine knows that Rake is likely to take on the tyrant rather than simply let the Jag Hut destroy the city even though it might weaken the Son of Darkness. Having neutralized Rake, she can send her own forces to attack and take over Durahustin. Rake says that he has allowed this to happen because, whilst he is not certain that he can take on the tyrant and win, he'd rather the Jag Hut awaken now, with him on hand to counter him, than at some other point when there might be no one around to do so. He tells Beric that as Lazine is unsure about the capabilities of the Torrid Cabal, she is trying to arrange for a contract with the Assassin's Guild to have them taken out. He then informs Beric that he forcing Shadow Throne out of the game was marked by killing two hounds but Beric needn't worry because this new feud concerns Moon's spawn and Shadow, not Duruhistan. Beric is unsettled by this talk and when Rake asks him if he has consulted the authority on Jag Hut that the alchemist had mentioned on a previous occasion, Beric leads Rake to a lower chamber where Mammut has fallen into a sleep and has yet to reawaken. Rake surmises that the priest has traveled by Warren to the Barrow into a concentration of Elder Warrens, and won't return until the clan and mass and the Otateral have left the Barrow. If the priest leaves too late, he might be enslaved by the Jag Hut Tyrant. Mammoth as High Priest of Drek is not only risking possession by the Awakening Tyrant, but possibly risking the Tyrant possessing Drek herself. Circle Breaker Mies Crocus Circle Breaker receives a signal from an old woman outside a tenement, and in turn signals Mies. Mies then retraces Circle Breaker's steps and gets a signal from the woman, prompting Mies to enter the back of a house which turns out to be Mammoth's residence. There, Crocus and Absailor have just arrived back and Crocus is puzzled by his uncle's absence. When he says that his assassin friend might know more, Absailor is visibly shocked by the word assassin and tells Crocus that for a moment she almost remembered something but it went away again. At that point, Mies turns up and warns Crocus that the Darl household believes he killed one of their guards when he stole Chalice's treasures and wants to hang him. Crocus realizes that Absailor must have been the killer but that the girl obviously does not remember anything about it. He thinks out loud that Chalice has betrayed him. Mies asks them to stay put where they are for the moment, as it will be safe. Surat. The t Standii assassin Surat is covertly observing the arrival and the actions of the coin-bearer. She had found him easily, remembering that she had already encountered the boy some nights past when she and two others had chased him across the rooftops. Surat assumes that her target will move at night and plans to kill him once he leaves the house. Murillo. Krupp and Murillo find that Crocus and Absailor are not at the Phoenix Inn when they get there but Krupp decides he needs some refreshment before doing anything else and seats himself at his usual table. Murillo tells him that he'd rather Krupp stayed out of his and Ralek's way than get involved but Krupp insists that he will anyway. Murillo finishes his ale and leaves through the back. As he steps into the back alley, Murillo is met by Circle Breaker who has a message for him about Turban Or. Ralik Nam. Ralik moves across the rooftops. He assumes that Ocelot will try to assassinate Kal before he enters Daruhistan and assumes that the assassin will position himself at Krolas Belfry, since the derelict temple where the Belfry is located overlooks the worry gate from where Kal will enter, giving Ocelot a perfect vantage point. Thinking of his clan leader's sorcery, Ralik remembers the otateral dust he received from Beric a few years back for a job well done which should make him impervious to magic. He ignores the warning not to let it touch his skin, as it might have unforeseen consequences, and does rub the otateral into his skin, starting with his face. Ralik reminds himself that the reason he wants to help Kal is because it is the last way he believes he can retain his final claim to humanity. He vows to himself that he will find and kill Ocelot, then begins his ascent of Kroles Belfry. Chapter 18 Duruhistan Whiskey Jack Whiskey Jack and Kalam Mecca agree that the assassin will go to the Phoenix in the next day and make a final attempt to contact the local assassin's guild. Should it fail, Whiskey Jack informs the squad, they will detonate the intersections. Quick Ben is unable to trace Sari and thinks she is likely dead. The bridge burners decide to abandon her. The entire squad is relieved that she did turn out to be an ascendant. Whiskey Jack had begun doubting the humanity of himself and the people around him, thinking it was possible for a human to become as brutal and bloodthirsty as Sari had been. 
He has been struggling to come to terms with the fact that he has led thousands of soldiers, and he, as a commander ordered several of these people to their deaths. It has become something that his conscience cannot come to proper terms with, and he has shunned making friends with his squad because he holds himself responsible if any of his squad come to harm. Fiddler then launches into a monologue, telling Whiskey Jack that they have lost friends, but they were living people who were very much human. But if the sergeant took away their humanity and looked at them without any feelings, so that he could avoid getting his own emotions into a mess when he lost those he commanded, then he was essentially taking away his own humanity. Although Whiskey Jack appears gruff on the outside, he finally realizes that he is amongst friends who really care for him, and want to see him reclaim his own humanity so that he can allay his own doubts. Paran Kal and Paran are approaching Daruhistan via Jadam's worry. Kal is in a very bad shape, since his wound keeps reopening. His entire left leg is sheathed with the blood he has lost, and it has left him very weak and semi-delirious. As they approach Worry Gate, during a brief conscious moment, he asks Peron to take him to the Phoenix Inn. Ralik Ralik is still climbing up Krolas Belfry, unable to keep his approach silent as he is tired with exhaustion. He hopes that Ocelot's attention will be directed eastward towards the gate, and he won't notice Ralik. Peron Peron arrives at Worry Gate with the unconscious call. One of the guards recognizes Kal as he used to serve under him and tells Peron that he'll get a wagon for the injured man to take him to the Phoenix Inn. As Peron looks towards the city, he sees a flash of movement on the platform of a belfry nearby. Ralik Ralik arrives at Krolas Belfry to find the place empty. He realizes that Ocelot must have hidden himself from view with sorcery. Ralik raises himself to the platform. As he does so, the Otadral takes effect and Ocelot appears in front of him, apparently aiming at something below. Ralik attacks but is tired and scuffing the stones with his boots gives him away. Ocelot spins round and fires a quarrel which vanishes without trace before reaching Ralik. The assassin jumps on the clan leader and stabs Ocelot's right arm but the latter retaliates and delivers a serious wound to Ralik's chest. Ralik breaks free and finally kills Ocelot but is traumatized enough to lose consciousness. His final thoughts are about Call, that he has done his best for his friend, and the rest of the plan's success now depends on Mirilio. Peron. Peron sees no further movement on the belfry and his attention turns to the approaching wagon. He helps get Call on it but looking at the man is amazed that he is still alive. Surat. Surat wakes up and realizes that she's been blindsided by someone while waiting for the coin bearer. It is unfathomable for her that someone should have been able to sneak up on her and ambush her. She mentally goes over a list of possible people who might have achieved that. Though the claw she encountered on the rooftops might have been skilled enough to accomplish this, he would have simply killed her. However, the person who incapacitated her had wanted to embarrass her rather than actually harm her. Nevertheless, she feels slighted and angry and vowing to kill the coin bearer the next time, she disappears into Kirold Galai. Mies and Irilta. Mies and Irilta have moved Crocus and Absailor into the attic of the Phoenix Inn. As Mies watches the two youngsters sleep she thinks that it is uncanny how easy it was, as if someone was keeping the way free. Irilta arrives and tells her that she has just witnessed the heavily injured call being brought in by a man who has the bearings of a soldier. They talk about their orders from the Yill, to stay put with Crocus and Absailor at the inn. They both agree that Crocus is not going to like being cooped up, that things are warming up and are bound to get frenetic in the following days. Peron Peron is sitting in the barroom of the Phoenix Inn, waiting, while Call is attended to by a local surgeon in a room upstairs. He moodily reflects about all the friends he has lost, compiling a list, talk, tattersail, and now possibly Call. He thinks the gods are shaping him up to become their tool by alienating him from his friends. He remembers Anamander Rake's advice that should his luck turn, he should either give the sword away or destroy it. With that in mind, he drives Chance into the table, intending to break it. Kalam Kalam enters the inn and finds everyone's attention on a man who seems to be about to break his sword. Kalam recognizes Peran and tells the captain not to break it as his luck still holds. As soon as Kalam tells Peran who he is, 
the captain having been unconscious during their previous meeting, Peran orders the corporal to bring Mallet. Peran. Peran orders the innkeeper to show anyone arriving back with Kalam to Kal's room, tells the room in general not to touch the sword, then goes upstairs. The surgeon leaves, refusing payment as he says he has failed. The assassin returns with Whiskey Jack and Mallet, just in time to save Carl Peron tells Whiskey Jack about his and Tattersail's suspicion that the squad has been set up to perish. He also informs the sergeant about the clan and mass accompanying Lorne. Whiskey Jack uses a magical skeletal forearm, a device harking back to the Emperor's days, to communicate with Dijek. Dijek informs them that Tashrin is currently full of questions. About the involvement of Opan, Shadow Throne and the Night of Darkness as well as the antics of a soul-shifted puppet. He tells them that the Empress wants to dismantle his army and send him to seven cities to take on the rebellion but that he will defy the order. Also, that adjunct Lorne and the Amass have reached the Jag Hut Tyrant's Barrow. Whiskey Jack and Peran update Dijak on events at their end. Peran is asking for more information before committing himself to anything as he wants revenge against Tashern. Dijik explains that Genabakis is lost and that the Morinth Alliance is about to change. His plan is to instead focus on attacking a new enemy, the Panion Seer who is about to embark on a holy war. Peron agrees to stay with the squad but asks for Whiskey Jack to remain in command. After the connection is broken, Whiskey Jack explains that the reinforcement plans Lorne brought Dijik had clearly shown that someone was condemning the Genabakis campaign to fail something even Dijek would not tolerate. Gadroby Hills The adjunct and Tool find the tyrant's finest in the form of an acorn. Tool explains that finding it gone, the tyrant will hunt it down. They leave the barrow. Chapter 19 Deruhiston Crocus Mies tells Crocus and Absailor to stay in the phoenix and attic then leaves. Crocus, however, is fed up with being protected and decides to leave via the rooftops. Absailor says she will come with him. Sir Rot. Sir Rot is waiting on the rooftop and moves to attack when she sees the coin bearer climbing out, but is rebuffed by some invisible force before she can even get close. Her cloaking spell still intact, she rebounds off a brick chimney dazed. Crocus. As Absailor follows Crocus out of the attic, she sees him crouched, daggers in hand. He explains he thought he saw something but then dismisses the incident as a figment of his imagination. Murillo Murillo is waiting for Ralic who is overdue, by now half convinced that his friend is dead. He thinks of the messages Circle Breaker passed on and ponders the identity of the eel. A suspicion about who it might be enters his mind. Hearing a sound, he opens the door and finds Ralic lying in front of it, covered in blood. The assassin is weak but when Murillo checks the wound he finds only a scar that looks pink and a week old. Ralic asks for a cloth to wipe off the otateral dust, but Murillo tells him that there is nothing on his face. Murillo then leaves to speak to the person he thinks might be the eel. Barak and Krupp Barak informs Krupp that it is in his power to discern the true identify of the eel's agent, Circle Breaker, but out of respect has never done so. He is considering the option now as the current situation in Duruhistan makes it imperative that he establish the eel's purpose, possibly with the aim of a closer alliance. Krupp admits that he is able to arrange a meeting and Barak requests him to ask the eel to meet with him by the evening. Peran Peran is mulling over what he has been told by Dijek and Whiskey Jack. He concludes that Dijek's defiance is about to get the commander outlawed and that the plan of causing chaos in the city will enable Dijek to appear as the rescuer and provide him with much-needed funds. Wiskjack confirms that he is correct but says the plan goes further. He reveals that Seven Cities is days away from rebellion against the Empire, so Lazine cannot in any way retaliate against the rebellious army since she doesn't have any army to do it with. Dijik needs Deruhistan and its wealth as he intends to take on the Panion Seer who is posing a threat not just to the Empire or the Genabakan continent, but to the whole world. Gadroby Hills Lorne Lorne works out that they have spent at least two days in the barrow. Tool says he will remain to further observe the Jag Hut, and if she changes her mind and wants to accompany him afterwards, he can be found at the same place for the next ten days. According to the Clan of Mass, the tyrant will be fully awake and free of the barrow in another two days. 
setting out for Durohistan, Lorne realizes that the doubts that have previously beset her have fallen away and is looking forward to meeting Sari and the opportunity to dispatch a servant of shadow, possibly the rope himself. Durohistan. Crocus and Absailer. Crocus and Absailer have gone to Crawless Belfry. As they climb up the stairs, Absailer is surprised that she can see in the darkness and tells Crocus that there is a story written on the inside walls of the belfry, but he doesn't believe her. She then tells him that there is some wet, sticky substance on the steps but again, Crocus, dismisses the information. Once on the platform, they discover Ocelot's body and Crocus identifies the dead man as being an assassin from the crossbow lying by his side. Absailer observes the moon though Crocus, to be contrary, looks at Moon's spawn instead. As he does so, he sees five huge winged shapes sweep down from it, disappearing in a northeasterly direction. Absailor meanwhile speaks of oceans and underwater gardens on the moon, recounting the tale of Growland Sea. Chapter 20 Durohistan Murillo Murillo is left puzzled by the healing properties of Otateral, and wonders if Ralic will recover enough to take on Turban Or. He also wonders about the Wheel of Ages which names the New Year of the Moon's Tears that is beginning this dawn. Mamet has explained to him that it is a mechanism that was a gift from Icarium to Durohistan over a millennia ago. Murillo runs into Krupp who gives him two masks for the fate at Lady Sintel's and updates him about Call's healing. Murillo unsuccessfully tries to persuade Krupp not to attend the event. He accuses Krupp of being the eel but Krupp casts a spell and Murillo promptly forgets what they were talking about. Beric Anamander Rake informs Beric that he will also attend the fate. He suspects a convergence, and a gathering of power always attracts more power. Besides, he suspects that most of Durohistan's powerful nobility will be in attendance, and this will make the fate a ripe target for the claw. When Beric mentions the new year is just beginning, Rake recognizes its name. Year of the Moon's Tears, as coming from one of Icarium's inventions, and when Beric confirms this, Rake advises he should heed Icarium's gifts. Rold announces that Mamet is awake and delivers a message from Krupp to say that the eel will see Beric at Sindel's fate that evening. Beric has his thoughts about the identity of the master spy. Mamet enters and tells them they have two to three days before the tyrant will be fully awake. He drops the name of his nephew Crocus into the conversation, making Beric realize that Crocus and the coin bearer are one and the same, but Mamet seems to know all about it already. Rake confirms that Mamet will be attending the fate as well, then excuses himself and leaves. Lorne Lorne enters the Rohiston through Worry Gate and goes in search of Whiskey Jack and his squad. Circle Breaker Circle Breaker is one of the guards on the gate and has recognized Lorne from the eel's description. His fellow guard, Barut, moans about having to work that evening at Sindel's fate and circle breaker, happy about this stroke of good fortune, volunteers to take his place. Lorne and Whiskey Jack Lorne reaches Quip's bar where she finds Fiddler, Hedge and Mallet playing cards using the deck. They have been expecting her, and inform her that Whiskey Jack should be back shortly. She observes as Fiddler seems to be inventing the rules as they go. The patterns seem to allude to past and current events, Cotillion's withdrawal, Rake's encounter with the hounds and him being close by. When Lorne makes a comment, Fiddler enters her into the game and places a card in front of her, throne, inverted, which he says means that she owes them all ten gold each, an amount which also happens to be that of the Empire Guild coin. The game is closed by Orb, True Sight and Judgment. Whiskey Jack enters and gives her a report about their activities, that the mining is done, that they have not yet managed to contact the Assassin's Guild and that the t and I are in town. When he tells her that they have lost Sari, Lorne informs them that Sari had been a spy and is probably hiding. Lorne then assumes command of the mission, telling him that all this independent crap is over, leaving Whiskey Jack seemingly in an angry mood. The two move to the back room to continue the discussion where they are not overheard. Lorne expresses disbelief at the presence of Andy I High Mages and Whiskey Jack tells her about the rooftop encounters. He informs her that they are due to attend Lady Simtel's fate that night as hired guards, where they intend to take out quite a few of the attending council members. Lorne tells him she has some business to take care of but will rendezvous with them in two hours. After she has left, 
Quick Ben comes out of his hiding place in the room and asks if the sergeant managed to fool Lorne. Crocus. Into the afternoon, Crocus and Absalor wait atop Krolas Belfry. Some of Sari's memories seem to be seeping into Absalor's mind since she can remember what Unta was like and how big it is, although she thinks she has never been to Unta. Crocus explains his plan to Absalor. He intends them to go to Sintel's fate where he will be able to speak with Chalice. He also mentions that his uncle will be there but omits to explain that he hopes the scholar will be able to look into Absalor's possession. Absalor explains that there is something inside her that keeps her together. Surat. Surat waits in the stairwell and again prepares to attack. However she is ambushed again, and this time she recognizes the voice of her attacker who also knows her. He tells her to pass on the warning to Rake as well, that the coin bearer will not be harmed, compliments of the prince. He advises her to take up any objections with their mutual friend and Surat leaves soon after the visitor. Crocus. Crocus has heard a sound but, again, brushes it off as being imagined. Gadrobi Hills. Rayest. The jag hut tyrant Rayest awakens. He recalls memories from his childhood when he was just a toddler, how he wrested power and how his mother disowned him and proclaimed the sundering of blood even though it broke her. He remembers how he became a tyrant and tried his power, first over nature then, when that proved futile, over creatures called the Amass whom he manipulated and controlled though they knew it not. They even proclaimed him their god. He had been unprepared for his own kin banding together to confine him. As he leaves the barrow, he vows he won't be caught off guard again. His plan is to first find his finest. Crone Crone watches from above as the tyrant emerges from the barrow onto the yellow grass humps of the Gadrobi Hills then observes the red dragon Solana leading four black soul taken dragons closing in on the barrow. Rayist. Rayus sends out his senses. He attacks the sleeping goddess beneath the earth, deciding for the time being just to wound her rather than kill her. The attack makes her stir but not does not awaken her, nevertheless, causing earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. As he sets out for the location of his finest which he judges to be about three days away, he is attacked by the dragons. He recognizes Solana and warns her and the others to keep away but only senses derision from them. He unleashes his warren in the direction the dragons fly off but is ambushed by them from the side. A ferocious battle ensues as Kirold Galine and Starveld Demelain sorcery collide with the Jagat's Amtos Felic. Chapter 21 Deruhistan Lorne. As the jag hut tyrant's finest is shaped like an acorn, Lorne decides to plant it like one. She does so in the heavily wooded part of a garden in the city. She still has two tasks ahead of her but one of them may be impossible as she senses nothing of Sari's presence. When she emerges out into the street, she loses focus for a moment. Passing thoughts about the futility of life make her realize that she is breaking down. She pulls herself together and decides to focus on her other task, finding and killing the coin bearer. Krupp. Krupp has been pondering the patterns of fate. His reading of events leads him to believe that Crocus is still in danger. However, he senses that someone else is also protecting the boy, someone who he has not factored in and at the moment, he can only trust in the integrity of that entity. He decides that Circle Breaker is due for retirement and ponders that the eel's cover may not last much longer. That does not worry him though as he had only needed his freedom to act until this day. Everything hinges on what will happen that evening, the pattern only shows him a blank after that. Crocus Crocus and Absailor head for the Centaur estate. Absailor is worried that Crocus might be betrayed by Chalice Darrow whilst Crocus in turn is worried that something might happen to him and thus harm Absailor so he instructs her to go back to the inn and find Mies or Irilta if that should happen. Whiskey Jack The bridge burners report to the captain of Simtel's house guard, Stillis, who is annoyed because he thinks that Trotz misled him into believing they were all barghast. Whiskey Jack points out that the captain would not have been able to afford them had that been the case. They get stationed with their backs to the unkempt part of the garden to prevent guests from getting lost in it. Quick Ben is rattled as the thunder and lightning in the distance is getting closer, signaling that the tyrant is in a battle and seems to be winning. Kalam. Kalam and Paran plan to kill the adjunct. Paran feels very tired, 
and thinks he may not be very useful in the fight and asks Kalam to keep him as the surprise factor, the one thing that might surprise the adjunct and freeze her for just one second. He tells Kalam to make that one second count. They head out to join the squad at the fate. Kalam spies the bartender. The assassin loses his patience, shouting at Skurve to inform the guild master of the assassin's guild that the Empire has a contract offer for the guild, which will be available at the back wall of Sintel's estate. Seeing the gray faces in the street give Kalam a nagging feeling, but he can't quite think why. Beric Beric and Anamander Rake are on their way to the fate. Beric feels assailed by the magic wielded in the distance, something he knows is affecting every mage in the city. He feels that they have hours at the most before the tyrant is upon them. Looking at Rake's mask, he thinks there is a secret to it, but does not know what it is. Turban Orr Turban Orr and Lady Simtal observe Beric's arrival and are taken aback by the imposing presence of Beric's guest, a seven-foot-tall man with a two-handed sword strapped to his back, wearing the mask of a black dragon. They greet the arrivals and introductions are made but the name Anamander Rake means nothing to Orr and Simtal. Murillo Beric. Murillo and Ralic are at the house, observing what is going on. Murillo is concerned that Beric might try and stop their plan, but Ralic assuages Murillo's doubts, saying he will not. Then they watch with disbelief as Krupp approaches Rake and Beric. Beric forewarns Rake that in this unlikely person, he is about to meet the mysterious eel. Krupp, pastries in hand and mouth, is introduced to Rake and compliments him on his exquisite face mask. He makes vague references to dragons, telling Rake it must be exhilarating to look at humans while flying from so far above. When Beric reminds him that it is just a mask, Krupp comments that such is the irony of life, and makes some allusion to one learning to distrust the obvious. A few more mutterings and he takes his leave, going ahead to survey the kitchens. Turbinor Ralik Nam Turban or recognizes Sir Cobreaker as the guard from Despot's Barbican, and in a flash of insight, recognizes that he was in a prime position all these years to spy on him. Thus establishing that the guard is indeed the spy he has been hunting for so long, he heads towards him to kill him, but collides with a man wearing a tiger mask. Ralik runs into the councilman, insulting him and baiting or into challenging him to a duel. Or shows his Estrasian doll as his second for political purposes since Astrasian is a political enemy. Murillo Murillo is seducing Simtal who briefly wonders why it has gone quiet downstairs but happy to believe Murillo when he says that the guests have just gone into the garden. Beric Beric is about to volunteer himself as his friend Ralik's second, despite the likely undesirable consequences, when Rake steps forward instead. As they walk out onto the terrace, Beric recognizes Mamet wearing the mask of a jag hut. Whiskey Jack When the dueling parties and onlookers spill out onto the terrace, the bridge burners recognize Animator Rake. Quick Ben does not think he will be much good as the magic battle outside the city is making his head reel. None of the mages present dare access their warrens as it would act as a lodestone to the approaching power. Whiskey Jack gives orders for them to resume their posts but for Hedge and Fiddler to have something ready just in case they need a diversion before setting off the intersections. At that point a young man comes out of the back garden and moves past the sergeant towards the house. Crocus Crocus squeezes between two guards and heads for Chalice. Recognizing the opponents, he stops to ask a guard for more details. As he does... Krupp appears who passes a message to the guard who is none other than Circle Breaker. The message contains information of a new life, a reward for the loyal agent for all he has done for the eel. Beric. Beric announces that he will adjudicate the duel, or says he will make it quick as he is distracted for a moment by the thought of where the hostess is. His second steps forward to promise that should or fall, he won't seek retribution. Ralik chooses not to show his weapons until the last moment, and as Turban attacks, extending his rapier rapidly, Ralik reveals his own knives, a curved knife in his left, with which he catches the attack and parries, and a dagger in his right with which he attacks. The duel is over quickly when Ralik manages to stab or in the chest killing him instantly. Dahl comments that he suspects this to have been an assassination but that he will not do anything about his suspicion. Beric tells Ralik that it is done, 
and tells him to go home. He then introduces Rake to the witch Duridan. Rake tells them that he will attend to the matter of the approaching threat himself if necessary, but he thinks that there is a threat closer by, the details of which are too sensitive to share. Duridan admits that the Cabal does not like to feel helpless but that she places her trust in Rake. Krupp Krupp ponders for a moment that Murillo should prepare for a storm as the crowd is turning its attention to the question of the missing hostess. Murillo. The courtier and Simtal are getting dressed, and she comments that it is odd that everyone should have retired to the terrace. Ralik barges into the room and tells Simtal that the guards won't come to her aid as they have been bribed and left their posts. He then informs her that the guild contract on call has been cancelled as or just died in a duel and that call will be reinstated. Murillo watches for only a moment as she seems to shrink into herself then leaves, leaving behind his ornamental dagger, knowing he will be the last to have seen her alive. He feels shaken up by the enormity of what he has just been part of. Crocus Crocus finds Chalice and throws a stone from a distance to get her attention. When she answers with a questioning, Gorla's, he lunges forward, puts an hand over her mouth, and carries her off into the darkness of the garden. Circle Breaker Circle Breaker sighs with relief at seeing Turban or dead. He is finally able to smile with relief. On his way out he notices Krupp fast asleep. I've done my part. Just another nameless stranger who couldn't run from the face of tyranny. Dear Hood, take the man's shriveled soul his dreams are over, ended by an assassin's whim. As for my soul, well, you shall have to wait a while longer. Circle Breaker, about himself and Turbinor, as he is about to leave the fate. Chapter 22 Gadroby Hills Rayist Rayist has driven two of the black dragons away from the battlefield, while two others still circle around in the sky. He has Solana on the run, and he knows that she is injured and hurting. Rayist exults in the power that he has and the destruction he has wrought. As he tracks Solana, he destroys a stone guardhouse containing creatures taller than a mast so that they won't be a distraction, then a man and his horse who happen to be riding close, just because he is irritated by their presence. By now, Rayest's body is completely shredded to pieces, but he is surrounded and held together by his Amtos Felix sorcery. He expects Solana to ambush him again beyond the next hill's summit but finds her regarding him from some distance, steadily, without the presence of her warren. Thinking it to be her surrender, he moves towards her. As he does so, the landscape in front of him changes and he finds himself in a vision before the time of even the Jag Hut. He meets Krupp, who proclaims that Rayist has not aged well and that this is his, Krupp's dream. Rayist attacks but Krupp appears in another place to the side to tame him. Hearing a sound, Rayist turns around and finds himself attacked by Tool who rips the tyrant's shoulder away with his flint sword the blow slicing through ribs and sternum. Krull then appears and confronts Rayist, telling him that he is not invulnerable. You are a fool, Rayist. In this age, even a mortal can kill you. The tide of enslavement has reversed itself. It is now we gods who are the slaves, and the mortals are masters though they know it not. Krull, trying to convince Rayist of his vulnerability, Krull offers Rayist a choice to fall by the sword of the first sword of the Tlan and Mass Empire, or accompany Krull to the gates of chaos, both a better fate than to meet death at the hand of Solana's master. Reyes, however, chooses to transfer himself to another body that he has already found, evading Krupp, Tool, and Krull. Deruhistan. Paran. Paran and Kalam are in Simtel's garden. Paran feels something very unnatural and heavy in the garden. He feels as if the garden is isolated from any and all environments, and everything is slow and heavy on all sides. Peron sees a young girl standing before a large block in Sintel's garden. Next thing Kalam rises behind her and attacks the girl with his knives. She moves in a blur, her elbow catching Kalam in his stomach and her knee hitting his midsection, knocking him to the ground. Peron moves forward to attack her with his sword, but stops when... In a girlish voice, she begs him not to. Kalam is surprised to recognize Sari. She responds that she thinks she should know him, but when Peran comes near, she remembers that she killed the captain and is upset by the thought. Enraged, Peran again moves to attack, but Kalam asks him to hold back, 
now suspicious that something about her isn't right. Their attention is drawn to the fact that the block is growing and Sari comments that it is made of wood and has roots. Following a hunch, Peran then goes to collect Mallet. Before leaving with him, tells Whiskey Jack about the oddness of Sari's behavior and that there is something else, something ugly. The sergeant tells him that if they are unable to contact the guild, they will let Fiddler and Hedge loose. Ralik. Ralik encounters Krupp but is startled to find that for once, the man is extremely serious and not in a mood to joke around. Krupp seems to be talking to himself, saying in a strange voice, Be on your way, friend, and something about the new world being more than equal to the might of Rayist, and that the new developments will take care of the tyrant. Ralik assumes Krupp is drunk and continues on, freshly beset with doubts regarding Kahl's will to make it back into the council. As he is walking, he is intercepted by a lady wearing a silver mask, who he recognizes to be Vorkin, master of the Guild of Assassins. Thinking that he is to be punished for his involvement in the events, especially the assassination of Ocelot, he tells her he awaits the punishment of the Guild. Vorkin, though, commenting that his imperiousness to Ocelot's magic is curious, asks him to accompany her towards the garden. Crocus Having dragged her to one side, Crocus has a conversation with Chalice, and it transpires that she did not betray him after all, that her father hired a seer who established that the guard had been killed by a woman, a servant of the rope. She is however in love with someone else, Gorla's Viticus. Additionally, Crocus realizes how different they are and as he is already uncertain about his feelings for her, he asks for her friendship instead. However, they both then make disparaging comments about each other's way of life and part acrimoniously. Crocus, hoping Apsailor stayed in place, heads towards the garden. Paran. Mallet won't set foot in the glade as the thing growing there is anathema to his Danel Warren so he asks for the girl to come to him at the edge. He reports to Paran that the possession is now definitely gone, confirming Paran's suspicions, but that there is a presence of another being a seer who has been protecting the girl's mind from the actions that she committed as Sari under the influence of the rope. He wants to further help this entity, a female, but is afraid that ultimately, she might have designs of controlling the girl herself. Based on what Malik currently senses of this entity, they agree that he should chance it. The three of them then hide in the shadows when they hear Kalam ordering someone to show themselves, and watch a man and a woman enter the glade. Crocus Looking for Apsailor, Crocus comes across three people in a glade, one of whom he recognizes as Ralik. He overhears them discussing the odd blurry stump in the glade and is shocked to discover that the woman is Vorkin, the master of the Assassin's Guild, and the other man a Malazan spy. Vorkin asks Ralik to approach the block as he seems unaffected by its aura and his approach seems to halt the growth. Ralik puts it down to the otaral dust he rubbed into his skin. Vorkin senses the presence of others and asks for them to come forward. Crocus recognizes Apsailor, who seems drugged, accompanied by two men. The Malazan spy, a bridge burner called Kalam, then offers Vorkin a contract on behalf of the Malazan Empire, for the guild to take out the true rulers of Derivastin, the mages who are operating covertly. The offer is 100,000 golden jakatas for each assassination, to be delivered by Warren upon completion and the title of High Fist with all its privileges. Borkin suggests to execute the contract in person as only a high mage will be able to stand up to the nine members of the Torrid Cabal. Before she commits herself, however, she wants to know about the approaching creature as she has sensed that it has been opposed by five dragons for a time, which can only mean that Beric has made a deal with the Son of Darkness. Looking taken aback by this news for a moment, Kalam reassures her that she will not be expected to deal with Rake and that given past events, the Teast Andii is likely to pull out rather than facing the Empire alone. He also assures her that come what may, Lazine, as a former assassin herself, abides by the rules of conduct amongst them. Vorkin agrees with his assessment of Rake and accepts the contract. She then asks Ralik to stay close to the strange block so that he can counter it for the time being until she returns as her instincts tell her that it is important to stifle its growth. Crocus is shocked by Ralik's apparent disloyalty towards the Ruhistan and hesitates to announce his presence once the others have left. However, Ralik has detected him and beckons him to come forward. 
He tells Crocus that he has to remain with the alien stump to stifle its growth, and that it is up to Crocus to warn Beric that Vorkin is a high mage and is coming after the Torrid Cabal. He informs Crocus that Mammoth is also a member of the Cabal and to go to him if he can't find Beric. Hearing of the threat to his uncle, Crocus agrees. At that moment they hear terrifying sounds coming from the terrace to which the stump responds with burst of fire and a swelling of roots. As Ralik throws himself on the stump, calming some of the responses, Crocus runs towards the estate. Quick Ben. At the terrace, Peran has just told Whiskey Jack and Quick Ben that Vorkin has accepted the contract when Quick Ben sees a large woman approaching an old man wearing a ghastly mask who is coming towards them. At that moment, the man is hit in the chest by a wave of energy. There is a bestial roar. The man's mask is torn away and he turns towards the woman raising his arms. Quick Ben has sprung into action the moment the energy wave has struck and manages to throw the woman to the ground thus preventing both of them being hit by the surge of power now coming from the old man which incinerates and destroys everyone and everything in its path. One lance of energy strikes Peran's sword and the captain vanishes from sight. Whiskey Jack is struck by falling masonry, which breaks his leg. When Fiddler drags him to safety, the sergeant blacks out. Quick Ben and the woman he saved attack the old man, whom they recognize as being Jaghut possessed, with sorcery. When the woman has exhausted her power, she tells Quick that is up to him to confront the man whom she names as Mamet. Peran. Peran finds himself in an unfamiliar landscape on the shore of a lake. He sees an Azath house rise from the lake as a clan amass with a two handed, Chalcedony sword battles, what looks like a tree shaped, tusked monster. Despite his incredible skills, the clan Amass is losing the battle and a blow from his opponent brings him to rest in front of Peran. He tells the captain that the Azath house is still too young to take that which called it into being, and that it is up to Peran now to hold the Finnist long enough for the Azath to mature. The Finnist easily counters Peran's attack but its attempt to destroy him awakens the hound in his blood, and he repels it with ease. Peran is stopped from shredding the Finnist completely to pieces by the clan Amass who informs him that he has held it long enough for the Azath to gain strength. The roots of the Azath then take the Finnist. Quick Ben Even as Peran reappears, Quick Ben unveils seven warrens and attacks Mamet. Despite this awesome display of power, the Jag Hut possessed still resists. The woman, named Derudin, draws Quick's attention to the approaching hedge. Seeing the arbalest in the man's hand and recognizing the manic glaze in his eyes, Quick Ben tackles Derudin once more. Crone Having observed Reyes disappear when he had almost reached Solana, Crone and the dragons wonder what has happened to the tyrant. Something draws Solana's attention westward and Crone shrieks in anticipation as she sees what the dragon has seen. Quick Ben The detonation of the Morinth munition has created a huge hole where Mamet had stood. Kalam approaches and tells Quick Ben that nevertheless, something is moving down in the crater. They see a shape forming at the bottom of the pit, and think themselves lost but it is taken by roots before it can do anything about it. Quick Ben and Derudin are astonished to hear of the existence of the Azath. Derudin hurries away, thanking Quick Ben for saving her life twice. Hedge and Fiddler head off to blow the munitions. Moments later Kalam realizes what has been bothering him that the intersections lie over the main valves of the city's gas supply. He takes off after them to stop the saboteurs from blowing up the entire city. Chapter 23 Deruhistan Janos Peran Making his way through the undergrowth of the Garden of Sintel's estate, Peran is pulled into the realm of shadow where one of the hounds first attacks him, his teeth punching through Peran's armor, then drops him. The hound, Rude, is confused, but Cotillion, who is also there, discerns that there is a bond of kinship between Peran and the hounds and is puzzled by this. He intimates that Shadow Throne regrets letting Peran go as it cost the life of two hounds who like the others had been thousands of years old. Cotillion does not know that Peran touched hounds' blood and Peran chooses not to tell him about his walk inside Dragnipur and how he freed the hounds as that would sound too much like begging. They talk about mortals being used as tools by gods. Cotillion to drive home his point of view, offers to restore Sari's memories, but Peran asks him not to since that would be painful for her. 
Cotillion says that his and Shadow Throne's plan against Lazine was flawed and they will have to start again. Peron, realizing his luck has now turned, gives up Opan's sword chance to Cotillion. This breaks their hold over him. Peron is returned to the estate garden where Mallet spots him. Quick Ben and Hedge, who have just battled the Jag Hut tyrant, spot him coming back and Quick Ben wonders where he has just been. Peron decides to go after Lorne, instructing Mallet to assemble the squad at the Phoenix and should they make it out of the mess alive. Crocus Crocus's thoughts are dominated by his uncle's death and the knowledge that his uncle was not who he thought he was. He runs through Simple's estate, and then the city streets in panic and desperation noting that unusually, the streets are empty. He remembers Ralik once calling him a leech drinking the blood of the city, and he resolves that he wants to prove that this is not the case, by helping the city. The sound of birds and the reek of birds' nests alert him to the presence of Moon's spawn hovering overhead. Not knowing what this means he decides to find Beric. Krupp Krupp eyes the abandoned feast in the estate's kitchen. He senses that the worst is over and that his plans have largely been successful with only the spin of a coin to be resolved. Lorn. Adjunct Lorn, waiting outside Simdel's estate, sees Crocus exit and racing down the street. She follows, realizing that Rake has survived and that therefore Whiskey Jack is also still alive. She wants to capture the coin bearer for the Empress to bring Opon to its knees. She thinks of herself as nothing but a weapon, a tool for the Empress. Hoping that the tyrant has at least damaged Rake, she withdraws a small glass flask and shatters it, releasing a Galine demon lord. Tasking it to kill Rake and telling him that freedom would be his if he did so, she speeds off after Crocus. Beric. In his chamber Beric mourns Mammoth's death, memories of hinted warnings from Rake dominating his thoughts. Deridden intrudes to join him and offer comfort. She updates him on events at the fate, telling him about the new Azath house, the mage who commands seven warrens and the Malazan soldiers. When they feel the presence of a powerful demon lord unleashed, Beric tells Deridden that this is what Rake must have been waiting for this all the time. They then feel the violent deaths of two of their fellow Torrid Cabal members, Peril and Tholus. Beric suspects Vorkin has killed them. And Amanda Rake. The two were silent for a long minute, then Krull sighed. I am lost. In this world. In this time. Rake grunted. You are not alone with those sentiments, eldering one. Do I follow in your steps, Lord? Do I seek out new battles, new games to play in the company of ascendants? Are you rewarded in spirit for your efforts? Sometimes, Rake said quietly. But mostly, no, I am not. The hooded face turned to the T standii. Then why? I know no other way of living. Rake talking to Krull about their struggles in this world. Rake is standing on the roof of Krull's belfry surveying the city and tracking the Galine demon lord. He looks at Moon's spawn, limping rather painfully and regret flashes through him. He remembers how it had been damaged at Pale. Krull suddenly appears beside him and they start talking about the tyrant and about them each being out of place in this era. Krull says he hasn't the power to assist Anamander at this time. Rake tells him he will try to keep his temple intact. Krull bows and leaves. The Galine Lord approaches and then veers into a soul-taken form. Rake also veers into his dragon form, and takes to the skies and, resolving not to retreat from the Empress anymore, he plummets towards the ground. Kalam. Kalam is running through the streets looking for Fiddler and Hedge. He knows the pattern of detonation the saboteurs will follow and pursues them. He rounds a corner and almost collides with them, but they dart past him seeming not to recognize him. Kalam grabs them by their hoods and asks them what the matter is. They point up the street to the massive Galine Lord shambling down the road. Recognizing it as Tashran's precious Galine Lord, Kalam tells the others to get to Sintel's estate. Kalam hides and waits, and sees the demon soon transform into a dun-colored dragon and take to the air. Kalam runs to join the sappers. Lorne. Lorne spots Crocus on the streets. She feels the time has come to act. Sneaking up behind him, she surges forward with sword's point extended. Crocus. 
Hearing the clang of metal behind him, Crocus ducks forward and turns to see Lorne engaged in an unbelievably fast sword fight with an unknown man. Another man introduces himself to Crocus as fingers of the Crimson Guard, explaining that Crocus has been under the protection of the Crimson Guard and the man he sees fighting is Corporal Blues, who lives for this stuff. He tells him that they had suspected that Crocus had not known what the two-headed coin in his pocket actually was, and that Opon has been using him. Fingers escorts Crocus, who decides to go to Barrack's estate. They part ways with Fingers advising Crocus that he should ditch the coin if his luck starts to go sour. Lorne Lorne cannot believe that she can't counter another swordsman, especially one not using sorcery, and keeps wondering who he is. Bleeding from several injuries, she breaks from the combat and flees, but is not pursued. Staggering, she decides to sit down and lean against the wall. She spots a large woman approaching. It is Mies, and she is here to kill her on behalf of the eel. Lorne senses and parries a hidden attack from Irilta, but is unable to prevent Mies sticking two knives into her chest. As she bleeds out on the street, Mies and Irilta leave. Peron. Peron finds Lorne sprawled on the street. They have a final exchange of words, Lorne wishing that Peron would have come earlier so that things might have turned out differently, before life leaves her. Peron takes the Otaro sword and scabbards it. Opun appears behind him, accusing Peron of having given their sword up to the rope. He instead says Cotillion took it. The twins are confused as to why Genos wasn't killed and fearful that High House Shadow now has the sword, Chance. The sister asks for the Ortotero blade, but Genos, disgusted with games of gods, warns them off and threatens them. They leave. Genos removes Lorne's armor and carries her body away. Anamanda Rake Anamanda Rake is high above the city. Silently he plummets. The dun dragon is circling below, hunting the streets. Rake thinks that the Galline Lord is foolish hunting for him looking down on the streets. Rake gathers his power in preparation and plummets down. Nearly on his prey, he opens his mouth and the whistling of the wind around Rake's jaw draws the attention of the Galline Lord but now it is too late. Chapter 24 Deruhistan Crocus Crocus runs towards Barak's estate, but rebounds from a ward that Barak has placed to keep away intruders. He is puzzling out how to find his way into the estate when a huge dragon crashes down into the street, throwing Crocus off his feet and destroying part of the walls of Barak's estate. Crocus tries to sneak away into the estate when the apparition, who has just assembled into a human-like form, turns his full attentions towards Crocus, freezing him to the spot in the middle of the road. It asks in a reasonable fashion why he wants to continue this and that the Empress will permit his escape again. Crocus agrees heartily, then frowns when someone behind him answers, calling the other Galine. A hand falls on Crocus' shoulder and its owner, a tall silver-haired man, whom Crocus recognizes from Lady Sintel's fate, tells him to flee. He also tells Crocus that Brood has convinced him to keep the coin bear alive. Then, the man, Anamanda Rake, focuses on the apparition, saying that it is going to be close. When the Galine tries to further convince Rake to leave, the teased Endi draws his sword. With a roar, Galine jumps at him, swinging his huge axe, with blue flames trailing it. The two fight with desperate strength, Anamanda ultimately overbearing his opponent with brute strength. He finally runs his sword through the horrified Galine who gets sucked into Dragnipper. As Anamander leans against the sword, Crocus observes blood coming from the Teast's shoulder where he has caught the Galen's blow. Rake urges Crocus to go and assist Barak who is in danger since he himself is in no condition to fight and defend the alchemist. Crocus takes off into Barak's estate. Barak. Barak and Derudin are ensconced in Barak's study. Derudin is sitting within a defensive circle but Barak is reluctant to join her there as he would not be able to use his magic within and as he is unconvinced about the circle's efficacy as a defensive mechanism, recalling that Otaro can easily counter magic. They hear a scream outside and Barak feels that his wards have been breached. Persuaded, he walks towards the circle just as Vorkin enters the room, her gloved hands glowing red. 
Her initial attack on Beric is foiled by a teased Endi woman who intercepts the assassin and delivers a flurry of blows until Vork encounters with a glancing blow which sends the Endi crashing into the wall. Beric attacks with his majory, but Vork encounters the spell, completely negating his attack making Beric realize that she is his superior in sorcery and he is about to die. At that moment, with her last strength, the Endi woman throws a knife at Vorkin, injuring her, then apologizes that she can do no more. Sensing Deridan invoking magic, Vorkin turns and throws something at her which fells the witch. Enraged, Beric attacks Vorkin physically but Vorkin forces him on the defensive. Beric sees Crocus in the doorway and throws himself to the ground as Crocus hurls two bricks over the top of him, which knock Vorkin unconscious. Beric tends Derudin who was knocked out by a knife covered in white paralt for which the alchemist fortunately has the antidote. When they turn around, they find Vorkin has gone and the teased Endiai woman is dead. Crocus then takes his leave having assessed that he is no longer needed. Paran and Whiskey Jack The bridge burners convene in Carl's room at the Phoenix Inn. They communicate with Dijek using the device from Whiskey Jack's satchel that allows them to communicate long distance with Dijek. He reveals that they are now officially outlawed and Seven Cities is about to rebel. Dujic will parley with Kaladin Brood and they are going to form an alliance with him if possible, to take on a third party, the Panion Seer. Whiskey Jack is promoted to Dujic's second in command and Peron commands the bridge burners. Dujic gives the entire squad the right to walk away if they wish. All bridge burners elect to stay and join Dijik's renegade army except for Kalam and Fiddler who will accompany Absailor back to the Empire, but intend to return if they can. Kal has been awake the entire time, and the squad worry that he has heard everything. Kal confirms this, but offers to help them get out of the city. Ralik Ralik is in Simtel's garden studying the thing which was just a tree stump less than an hour ago, but is now a house with windows, balconies and a massive door. The glade has become a kind of burial ground with mounds, one of which took the body which the roots captured earlier. Ralik feels that there is a feeling of rightness about it all, and he feels an affinity with the house. Vorkin appears, covered in blood and breathing heavily, and requests Ralik to save her from the Andii who are hunting her for killing one of them. Ralik carries Vorkin into the house. Corlet. Corlet and the other T Standii see their quarry disappear inside the strange house. Corlet recognizes it as an Azath house and tells the others that the doors will not open for them. Corlet calls off the hunt, invoking her right to do so as she is blood kin to Surat, the one killed by Vorkin. Orphantal asks Corlet to summon their lord, but Corlet says to leave him to his recovery and that the Azath is still a child and as such should not be harmed. They leave. Krupp, Crocus, and Nurilio. Krupp and Murillo are outside the Simtal estate and observe the retreating moon's spawn. They are joined by Crocus who is worried that Absailor has been kidnapped by the Malaisans, and that Ralik is still in the garden but Krupp says he knows where she is and nothing is to be done about Ralik. Krupp then talks about the fair maiden who was saved at the fate by Gorlas but Crocus is only confused by the reference. Murillo laughs, telling Krupp that he has the wrong fair maiden in mind. They start walking back to the inn, and Krupp starts telling them about the events which have turned Kahl's fortunes. Epilogue Lake Azza Mallet inquires about Whiskey Jack's health, asking about the headaches and the leg. Whiskey Jack feels the headaches are much better now, but Mallet still finds cause to worry about the leg that Whiskey Jack had broken and has not properly healed yet. As the remaining bridge burners prepare to leave with the Morinth, they watch Moon's spawn heading south. Quick Ben is thinking about a scheme of his which will make Whiskey Jack howl when he hears it. However, he feels it is not yet time to tell him about it. He feels he needs to give the old man a chance to rest. Peron promises himself that he will search for Tattersail once the Panion Seer has been dealt with. He speaks in his mind to Tattersail and is amazed when in his mind he hears her response. She says she awaits him. Crocus has joined Absailor. Kalam and Fiddler on their journey back to the Empire. He tells Kalam that he misses some of the people in Duruhistan already, but is looking forward to seeing Unta and Itko can he asks Kalam if he believes in luck and the assassin growls a negative. Crocus agrees and flips Opun's coin into the sea, where it vanishes beneath the waves. 
Circle Breaker, on his way into retirement, looks on with approval, knowing that the eel will be pleased to hear about this. The End That was a recap of Gardens of the Moon by Stephen Erickson, Malazan Book of the Fallen, Book One.